Hey guys, welcome back to R&B Reptiles Presents. I suppose that's what we're going to call it. So uh, we have Justin Julander here. And uh, yeah, you guys are going to have to stick around for this one. It's going to be a great episode. That's it. And now we'll, that's it. we'll get in. Really, okay, Justin, we're going to do the your same best with everybody else, but I want to know what got you into reptiles. I want to know what your first species is you started breeding, and then the whole build up from there. Okay. So, I guess, like most people, the whole, you know, liked them as a kid, was fascinated by them, got into them probably through like dinosaur books in elementary school. And then I was fortunate enough to have really great parents that like took me out, let me collect stuff, bring it home including uh, like rattlesnakes. You know, I had a couple of rattlesnakes as a kid. Um, just whatever, uh, whatever I thought was cool. They'd say, my mom was a little, you know, iffy about the rattlesnakes. But my dad's like, ah, she'll be all right. You know? <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, uh, I think the, the first species I, I really, you know, I, I bred, I guess, or, or got into in a, in a big way. It was probably the bearded dragons back in uh, the late 90s. Um, I saw a bearded dragon scratch around her cage at a pet shop and I went, I want that one <laughs> and, uh, took her home and she laid like 30 eggs and I raised <laughs> up the babies and sold them back to the pet store for like 50 bucks a pop back in the day. That was, wow. you know, how, how much bearded dragons went for. And then, uh, um, you know, invested in more bearded dragons. And then I kind of went a little faster than I probably should have and got like a bunch of bearded dragons from all these different pet shops. And then, of course, you wind up with issues like internal and external parasites and all that good stuff. So um, that project kind of was a good lesson in how to do a breeding project and, you know, quarantining and things like that. So it taught me a lot, but a lot of fun. I have a soft uh, place for bearded dragons since then, but yeah, they're a cool species. And then it, um, I realized lizards are a lot more work uh, and with my uh, schedule. So when I started breeding, I was finishing up a, a bachelor's degree. And then we moved up here where we are now up at Utah State in like Logan, Utah, northern, almost the Idaho border. Um, and uh, it was a little colder up here and the houses we were renting were pretty crappy. And so some of the projects I had going had to kind of wait for a while, but snakes were pretty conducive to, to just about anything. So they were all right. So I'm mainly focused on snakes, but now I'm trying to get into a few lizard projects again. Nice. Right on. <laughs> what, what, uh, what snakes were you working with? So the first snake, so my wife was a little iffy about the snakes. When we first got married, I had a boa constrictor and she kind of, uh, had me not bring that one along to the marriage. And so <laughs> I moved him on to a different place. But then, so I had to find a way to get her interested in snakes to some extent. And tiny little milk snakes were really pretty and they, you know, like this big little worms. And so she's like, oh, that's really cute. And she'd hold them and giggle and stuff. And so I'm like, let's get some of those. And so we got some of those. And then she's like, okay, they're not so bad. And then, uh, I got some baby jungle carpets. I'm like, yeah, they get five or six feet and, you know, eventually, but right now they're just little cute things like that milk snake. And so she was okay with it. But um, now she's even to the point where she'll feed stuff when I'm in Australia and uh, take care of some of the snakes and stuff. So she's uh, really good. Plus she lets me go to Australia, which is a pretty good wife right there. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Are you taking an annual trip to Australia or how many times do you do this? I've, I've gone five times and, and I wish it was annual and, uh, you know, I'd like that if that were the case, but I try to go as often as I, I can, but you know, it's, it's tricky to go over there. I always have the mentality that if I'm going to go make, you know, make the flight over there, I might as well stay for like at least two, maybe three weeks. So that's kind of what I've done. And it's tricky to get that much time off of work and to have, have a job if I, when I come back. So but my work's been really good to let me go. I think the first trip was three and a half weeks. The second trip was about the same. And then uh, it's been less time after that. So, yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm jealous. This is two weeks in a row we've had people on that have been to Australia. Uh, and well, we had somebody yeah. from Australia on four weeks ago. So, um, yeah, I'm itching to get to Australia at some point. Yeah, 
I, think I we highly all. recommend it. I mean, I, I don't know. I guess the way I do trips is uh, pretty inexpensive. It's probably, you know, one of your high-end snakes. So you just have to go with one less snake and you can make a trip over there, camp out and stuff. It's it's not too bad, you know, maybe three to $5,000, depending on if you go and split costs with friends or whatever, but pretty doable. Not too bad. I think um, Brian had that sketch. What Brian did that trip with a bunch of people maybe eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And mm-hmm. I want to say it was $6,500 and it covered everything, every zoo, every hotel, every plane ride over there. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do it on the cheap like you to tell you the truth. I'd be kind of afraid of sleeping outside, but um, yeah, <laughs> you know, everything else sounds great. Well, I, I, on a trip, I went with a couple buddies that were, you know, reptile uh, fanatics or whatever. And, and they, uh, I, I brought a tent. I didn't really tell them I was bringing a tent, but they, I think one of them brought this little pop-up deal and it broke pretty soon. I think it made it kind of limped it along to the end of the trip. But then uh, Steve Sharp, uh, he, he's a good buddy, but he, he uh, slept out under the stars and nothing happened. No. No uh, crazy insect bites or snake bites or anything. So, yeah, no, nothing that time. Nothing that time. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Just you got lucky <laughs> that one time. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. It, it my when I went over on a trip with my wife, and um, she she wanted uh, a little more secure uh, facilities for our trip. So we rented one of those hippie vans that had the you know fold down bed in the back and. Spent you know three or two weeks around Western Australia, and then we went over the East Coast. That was the same time uh, that Barcheck brought that group over, and so we actually went herping with them on one or two nights. And I gave a uh, talk at the same uh, symposium or festival or whatever they called it that Brian did. So yeah, it was pretty fun. But I was a little, I felt bad for some of the guys that were in the group because we were herping in, around Brisbane area. And uh, they had to go back to the hotel while I got to keep herping. So, <laughs> and right after they left, we found this beautiful coastal carpet. It was like yellow. It looked like a jungle, yellow and black, you know, sitting on the side of the road. So, yeah, I felt yeah. bad for them. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. Least you got to see it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I wasn't complaining. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I like the freedom of being able to go and plan my own thing and do my own thing. I, I thought about like doing a tour over there. I thought it'd be fun to you know get some people and take them all and show them some stuff but uh maybe someday that'd be a great time yeah yeah maybe uh, that'll be the one time i go to australia yeah <laughs> yeah i'm i've got a trip planned in in october if if the whole covid thing doesn't shut it down but actually i'm tagging along with some friends uh eric burke and and rob stone are headed over so rob asked me if i wanted to join them so i'm, I'm gonna head over there with them it's not too bad of a time to be in Australia. That's around the time a lot of people start having their babies hatch or so on and so forth. Or what's the season like over there? Because they're the complete opposite of us. Yeah, yeah. That's just kind of on spring. So it's it can be hit or miss in the spring. Like um, I've done – most of my trips have been in October, November time frame. And so um, – October, the, the first time I went to Western Australia in October was fantastic. Like we saw a ton of stuff. And then I went with my buddies a month later and, and saw less. I mean, we saw plenty of stuff, but it was less numbers, I guess, in November. So, you know, like anywhere, spring is probably one of the better times to go out and see stuff. Um, it, but, you know, of course, it depends on the species you're targeting. Uh, I, I went to Alice Springs area, Central Australia in October and it was the wettest year on record. And so like it rained basically the whole time we were there and like botanists were seeing plants that they'd never seen before because they'd been dormant, you know, waiting for big rains like this. There were like flocks of budgies and other parrots that the locals had never seen, you know, flocks coming through that area. So it's kind of epic, but you know, we got to watch waterfalls come off Uluru and stuff like that. But um, at the same time, not many reptiles were active with all mm-hmm. the rain. Mm-hmm. Got to see plenty, you know, it was cool. But there, we were sleeping in this uh, canyon, and and uh, when I got home, I look on Facebook, and one of the uh, somebody who had gone there maybe two or three weeks after me, after the rains had cleared, there was like a parenti living at the on that road up to the canyon that we probably could have seen if it wasn't so rainy. So you know, it's a little timing. And then uh, Rex Nindorf at the Alice Springs Reptile Park. He told us like December, January was the time to be there. He said, you can't even hardly drive on the road. There's so many geckos and snakes and stuff crossing the road. So that sounded nice too. So I think I need to start planning trips uh, at different times of year to see different things. 
Um, right. Yeah, I've got a work trip tentatively planned for 2021, you know, assuming it can go through, but um, it's in like May or June, which is in the middle of their winter time. But that, that might be the time to hit the Kimberly and look for rough scale pythons, you know, more of that tropical monsoon place. Did I go away? My computer right. slept. Okay. No, you're here. <laughs> I lost, I just went black on my screensaver. So, but uh, yeah, so um, I, I'm hoping to make it up to the Kimberly before the cane toads go up there and decimate it. So they're headed through there. So see how it yeah. goes. That's cool, man. What What's your, uh, favorite animal that you found in Australia that you were like, oh man, I was, you know, doing this or whatever. And yeah. a picture. I, I've got a couple stories. So I don't know. I, I've got lots. Of, it's like asking me which my, which, which of my kids is my favorite. Right. So, so you have a favorite. I mean, we all know. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the first trip of course is always like, you know, one of those things that you just remember, right. Your first reptile you see or whatever. So, I, so we flew into, Cairns, that was my first area that's up in you know, on the uh, the Cape York Peninsula. And uh, I, my dad was, my it was me and my dad. My dad was feeling kind of sick. And so he's like, I'm going to get a hotel room and sleep. And I'm like, I'm going to take the rental car and drive around <laughs> and see what I can find. And so, you know, I had some uh, localities and stuff I wanted to check. So I drove to this lake that one of my friends had recommended that, you know, where I could find scrubs and jungle carpets and stuff like that. And, uh, I walked around the lake at night by myself, just like with a flashlight, you know, headlamp looking at every tree, just studying it, you know, just expecting around any corner I'd see, uh, you know, some kind of python or something. But um, I did find uh, a leaf tail gecko, uh, uh, Cornutus, which was a, which was a cool find. It didn't have a tail, so it kind of lied, you know, there's no, no leaf tail on that gecko, but um, it was one of those things where, you know, they're, they're really cryptic. So I was just really excited to be able to uh, spot it. And then uh, that was kind of like my first, you know, wild reptile. Um, so that one sticks out, at least in, in Australia. But um, the, the, this, that same trip, uh, we went on a hike around um, this, uh, what's the place called? Um, it's, it's, you know, one of these rainforest spots along the river and stuff. And it's a good spot for Boyd's forest dragons. And, you know, I kind of knew what I was looking for and what size tree they'd be on. So I'm just looking at every tree and uh, we were just hiking along through the forest. And finally, you know, you see that image that you've been just scanning for and waiting for. And uh, I saw this big old male Boyd's forest dragon just hanging out on the side of a tree. And that just is burned into my retinas. You know, I, I, close my eyes and see that every once in a while. It's, it's just a, one of those iconic things where you see, you know, something you've been looking so hard for and finally see it. So that was cool. Um, uh, I guess my favorite reptile over there is probably the Parenti and, and we'd stopped in like, um, at the mouth. we were hanging out by a beach. There was like a free shower there or something. So we were showering off in one of the beach showers and, uh, and then we took a little nap. It was like the heat of the day. We didn't expect much to be out. So I'm just laying on my uh, sleeping pad in the in the park. And all of a sudden, Steve uh, Sharp comes running over. He's like, dude, there's a parenti right over. And I'm like, bolt upright, run over to the car. And it's like cruising under our car. And we sat and followed that thing for a good half hour, you know, 45 minutes until it had enough of us and took off. But that was the one I really wanted to see. And um, got awesome. to see it. So, yeah, it was really fun. But I, I'm sure. Oh, okay. One more. <laughs> Since you posted my arm here, right? Um, we were walking through a canyon in Karajini in Western Australia. And but Karajini is probably the coolest place on earth. It's, it's these red rock canyons, um, you know, permanent water going through. You can find big uh, barren olive pythons, stuff like that. And uh, um, we're walking along. I think me and my wife were having a little argument because she didn't want me to go into the canyon at night. And I was trying to go to the canyon at night, you know, asking her, hey, what if I go just dip down here for a little bit and go through the canyon? And I, no, no, you can't do that. I'm like, oh, you're telling me I can't, do, you know, one of those fun little conversations. <laughs> and uh, I didn't go to the canyon at night. I went, on, I had to go on the next trip when I was with my buddies. So if that tells you anything. But anyway, we're walking along and kind of having this little discussion. And uh, I look over on the wall and there's this, uh, Hammers Leansis, one of the Southern Pilbar rock monitors, hanging out on the rock. I'm like, okay, conversation done. We're going to watch this lizard. And we just sat and watched it. 
crawl all over, eat bugs. It was so cool. And then it just, um, when it was done kind of eating and foraging, it just crawled up on this little shelf and just laid down and like was overlooking this valley. I've got this great shot of it just looking over the canyon. Ah, uh, that was that was a fun find too. Yeah, uh, it's epic. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, one, one more. All right, so we were, <laughs> we were, my wife and I were headed back to Perth to catch our flight in the morning, and and uh, we were staying with a friend in Perth, and we so we wanted to be there kind of at a reasonable hour. So we planned to be there around six or seven or whatever. But then we were cruising through this one area, and there were these two uh, DOR um, imbricata, uh, the Southwest carpet pythons, on the road. And I'm like, if there's two DORs this close to each other, this has got to be a pretty hot spot for this python species. And so I'm like, hey, let's let's hang out here until it starts to get dark. And I was like, well, I don't want to inconvenience our friends. You know, there might be a chance you're not going to find it. I'm like, okay, give me a half hour after the sun sets, and then we'll go, you know, if, if I don't find one in a half hour. And so she's like, okay. And so um, sun goes down, start cruising five, 10 minutes after we start cruising, here's this big old imbricata starting to cross the road. And I, I jump out, I'm taking pictures and videos and stuff. And, and, uh, that was, that was an epic find too. I was pretty excited about that. <laughs> so, and then she, I, I was down kind of in the brush taking pictures and videos and, and uh, all of a sudden I hear, Justin, where are you? Justin. And I'm like, I, I'm trying to video, you know, so I'm trying to be quiet. And she's like, are you okay? Where are you? <laughs> yeah, I just kept yelling to me. And finally, I stopped being. I'm like, I'm good. I'm just recording. I guess I said it a little too aggressively, but she's like, <laughs> okay. yeah. So that was uh, that was that was another favorite find. Too many, too many favorites. And that, I mean, that's we like to hear the stuff, and that's why yeah. you're on. <laughs> well, this this uh, weekend, I went down to St. George, which is in the southwest corner of Utah, and. Uh, Went herping with a couple uh, guys down there and, and spent the weekend down there. And uh, there was, um, you know, I was hoping to find a Gila monster, of course, because that's kind of the, the best find down in that area. And uh, we were coming back from looking, you know, in this good spot where they'd seen them before and and uh, heading back on the trail. And I was the last one in line. I can't remember. I was lagging behind a little bit. And all of a sudden I heard kind of some rustling off the side of the trail and I look over and I kind of go off the trail. I'm like, that's a Gila monster. I'm like, Gila! And they come running back, you know, have this big photo session and stuff. But we were like, like just right near the car park area. So we were almost back to the cars. And, and if I wasn't there, they would have just walked right past it. Wouldn't have even, you know, wouldn't have noticed it. So got to, got to pay attention to those little sounds. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Cool stuff. I, I did see those on your Facebook. Uh, yeah. Shared pictures of that. It was awesome. Yeah. You got really yeah. close up. It was yeah, he was, he was a good looking lizard, too. Yeah, really pretty pattern. And Utah Gila's are, are just the best Gila's. I mean, they're just really kind of a reduced black pattern. Really pretty. Uh, Salmon y yellow color. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> fun find. I'm still uh, smiling ear to ear from that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, what other, um, so I only got to Facebook stalk you a little bit. I think Benjamin put most of the time into stalking this week. Um, <laughs> so currently, you know, I have an idea of some of the species you're working with, but, um, what all do you have going on right now? Um, mainly focusing on, uh, uh, Australian pythons. That's kind of been my bread and butter for a long time, especially the Anteresia genus. So I've got all the, all four species and both subspecies of Stimson's python. Um, pygmies, uh, spotted and children's and, uh, actually I, I hatched out all of them this year, uh, except for the Western stems, the eggs are still in the incubator, but I've hatched out Easterns, uh, the, uh, the, the children's and the spotted and pygmies. So, um, all of them produced this year. Uh, the, the pygmies didn't go last year, so I was happy to get some of those. And the first ones that came out of the egg were spectacular. So I'm really excited. I don't not sure I want to sell any of those. They look good. Really <laughs> but I've also got a, another clutch of 12 cooking. So um, that'll that'll be good when they hatch out too. I had some uh, clutches hatch out today. So I was going to have my daughter run down and grab some boxes. I can show you a couple. Uh, That'd be awesome. Today. But um, the uh, Woma, Woma pythons hatched today. So I've got Woma eggs, another, another clutch of Womas as well, as well as some black-headed eggs um, cooking now. Oh, you got um, Western blackheads, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was commenting on that one. I'm, I'm stuck on those, man. Yeah. <laughs> I've been uh, waiting for this moment for a long time. Well, I, I, you know, ever since I knew there was Western Blackheads, that's what I wanted. And they're harder to find in the U.S., especially with, um, you know, good lineage on them that haven't been crossed to Easterns or something like that. And so, hey, do you want to have them grab, a, grab some eggs? Okay. Uh, the two on the top. So, um, the, uh, the, what was I talking about? Yeah. The blackheads. I finally was able to get a pair from Ryan Young. So he had a couple pairs and I went and saw him at his house and Ryan's like Mr. Locality. Like he knows if things are, are, are have good lineage and good background or else he doesn't get them. So I knew they were good getting them from him. So, um, he, he traded me a pair for a bunch of blue tongue babies. And so, um, I, I've had some had some eggs hatch, but uh, or eggs laid, but none of them have hatched yet, and so that's kind of a been a bummer. But uh, you know, what do you do? So, <laughs> so this this time I've still got three eggs going strong, so hopefully they'll make it the distance this time. So, yeah, and nice. How many blue tongues did you get this year? Um, I I've only got one litter so far, and it was uh, the the baby didn't. Uh, do so well it was one baby that and a bunch of slugs and the baby was kind of weak so that first litter didn't go well that was for my oldest female but i've got two females that are ready to pop uh northerns and uh i don't think my western's going this year so i'm uh she didn't really start feeding heavily after last year's baby and and didn't really gain her weight back so i i wasn't even sure i was gonna pair with the male but then she started eating well and uh and stuff so I decided to pair up, but she didn't. I don't think she's going to go. She's not gaining enough weight. Thanks. So, yeah. Uh, but I guess she could surprise me. That wouldn't hurt my feelings. But <laughs> yeah, right. So this is, uh, this is the clutch of uh, eastern stems that just, just barely hatch. So they're probably not too exciting. They're probably still, you know, that egg uh, shine on them. But, you know, pretty nice. This is from one of my – oops, where's the camera? <laughs> this is from one of my – Really nice pairings of Eastern stems. I, I've got, wow. I've uh, really refined these guys, and they're really nice. A lot of people think they look like, a, yeah, you can leave that on. Um, almost look like Western uh, stems. There's one in here that's really light, but it's still attached to the umbilicus and just hanging out on the side of its egg. But it's really, it's almost like a hypo or something. It's really crazy light. So, uh, I guess I'll post some pictures of those when they when they're out and shed and stuff. They always look. Not, not as good when they haven't shed yet. And then uh, I'm really happy to have Womas again because they took the year off last year. And uh, I've got some yeah, pretty nice line of Womas. They're good-looking snakes. So got that. Yeah. really, these guys develop a really orange belly and, and uh, just look good. So um, Those are nah. good-looking, man. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm really – oh, God, I'm having a hard time with the, the camera here. <laughs> It happens to everybody because it's in reverse. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. That head is so orange. It's awesome. Ah, yeah, they're so cool. So um, with Wilma's, you know, I've heard a lot of people, you know, we've had a little trouble with eggs. So I'll say, you know, we usually lose like one or two eggs a clutch on average. Uh -huh. um, I've talked to some people that get 100% hatch rate. I've heard of a million different ways to do it. Um, what do you do for your Wilma eggs in the incubator? Um, I, I add a little less uh, water on the front end, but then uh, with this clutch, I really just made a point of opening up the egg container uh, pretty often during incubation to get some air exchange. Um, I've heard, you know, that was uh, uh, advice given to me by a, a guy who produces a lot of blackheads, Jordan Parrott. So um, that, that was really helpful. And I got, I think only one, uh, the Womas died in the egg this year, which is you know, pretty good. Um, usually I've had the same problem that you, you're talking about where, you know, half the eggs hatch. So I think it's just that air exchange is important. And if you have a bigger um, uh, egg box for those, um, they're really just sensitive to moisture, it seems. So I'd give them a bigger space, bigger egg box. And then um, I've got them just incubating straight perlite, but I've hatched them on vermiculite or perlite vermiculite mix or on the great over water. So it seems like a lot of different ways work. I've got the blackhead eggs on great over perlite with water, with, you know, a bit of water underneath them. And, uh, I've just been opening the egg box every day 
So that I think the Barker, that Barker method of using like a, a, a foam uh, box with, with uh, um, glass over top, you know, on the incubation media that allows for pretty good air exchange. So, yeah. Get out of here. Chicken. <laughs> Now, where did my family go? They were supposed to take them back, too. <laughs> okay. That's right. Um, I believe it might have been my friend's grand and Mary uh, with Rec Room um, with their Wilma eggs. And if this is them, I could be confusing somebody else. They started using the Sims boxes, mm -hmm. had them mm -hmm. on the shelf, and then would have the box at an angle, allowing the water and the moisture to build up on the top and then just kind of go down and drip down the other side, never making contact with the eggs. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know how many air holes they had in there for that, but um, if it was them who told me they did it that way, they said they had a lot of success or the numbers got greater when they started going that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would make sense because, I mean, that's the moisture, that extra water um, dripping on the eggs or something is what kills. And I think this egg that uh, the baby that died in the egg was uh, probably because of that, where um, when I'd open the box, like the water would kind of, you know, run down a little bit and then drip. And I'm like, oh, come on. So I'd have to wipe off the eggs. And I think that egg was kind of one of the ones that was in the way or, or hmm. you know, about the majority of the water dripping on it. So, um, what do you do? Yeah. 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 You'd think I'd learn by now, but I still make all these stupid mistakes. <laughs> uh, so, well, I mean, go ahead, Ryan. So I'm just curious. I want to, I want to hear about your uh, pygmy pythons because we got ours from you, and we yeah. kind of like go to you for all our advice when it comes to this sort of thing. So, um, uh, how's your your uh, collection going with them? How's your season going? Um, any advice for people that are trying to work with them? that because they can be difficult to start you know what i mean yeah oh that's i mean that's the big challenge with these guys but i um the the season's going really well i got two two clutches from my two females i only have two i i lost one pair um last year or the year before they were they were like from 2002 or something so they were getting a little on the old side mm. um but uh the, I mean, this other female that I got eggs from was in 05, and so she was she was pretty old as well. But she gave me 12 good eggs, and they're still cooking. Wow. So I think everything hopefully will go well with those. Um, the uh, the it's really easy to breed them, as you guys have seen. You know, they they produce really well, and they're they're easy to breed. But it's just getting those babies uh, started that's a challenge. Now I sold it, so. I was a little worried because my younger female that I was holdbacks that produced those three eggs that hatched uh, recently, they're just red as can be really, really nice looking babies. Um, so I was, I, I had bred her last year. That was her first year and she got egg bound. So I was worried she wasn't going to be able to breed again. Um, I let her just kind of pass the eggs on her own and she eventually uh, got the eggs out, which was, a relief, but I, I was worried she might be messed up reproductively after that, um, which is one of those fun things whenever you're working with animals, you know, that's a chance that that can happen. But um, she uh, laid a clutch this year, and as you can see, it, it worked out really well. So she's, she's good. Uh, and then my older female didn't go last year, and I was worried she wasn't going to go this year again. So I had um, found, found a guy that I'd sold some uh, uh, pair to, and he had produced. And he had really good luck with his eggs. Um, Jeff Taylor's his name, and he he's down in Florida. But he produced a clutch of six or eight last year, and he, mm -hmm. he got them all to raise up just fine. And I'm like, oh, gee, oh. You know, what'd you do? Like, and and uh, he <laughs> he said he fed them um, chicken baby food with like a syringe with a like a blunt needle on the end, and he just you know. Uh, syringe feed them chicken baby food. So I've got a case of chicken baby food out of my, out of my reptile room. I'm going to give it a shot, see if I can, uh, you know, replicate a hundred percent success. I mean, granted, I, you know, I don't know how many babies he was feeding. I, I usually have upwards of 30 or 40 Antaresia babies. And, uh, you know, that's a lot, of, a lot of babies to get going. But yeah. um, so I'm hoping this will work because that'll be a lot easier than assist feeding a tail or, you know, hind leg, like I typically do with my aunt babies, if, if they're not, uh, um, gonna, you know, eat on their own. So, uh, it seems like with, uh, um, more, uh, generations produced in captivity, uh, they're, they're going a little easier onto rodents. Um, I guess you'd 
have a, the best example with maybe like a Western hog nose. Um, you know, they, in a wild hog nose, you have a really hard time getting that to take a road and they want toads and, and, uh, amphibians. But, you know, the more we cap to breed them, the easier they are to get onto rodents and, uh, with, with very little effort. So I'm hoping the same will be, uh, you know, the case with Anteresia, but, uh, it seems like once they hit a certain size, they're, they're like almost automatic pilot on rodents. So they're really easy, uh, after that, but it's just getting them to that size that uh, can be a challenge. Oh, we know. <laughs> we'll know. Yeah. We, we finally got one that now eats frozen thawed right out of my fingers. If I dangle it in there, oh, yeah. like we, so that was last year's production out of five. I believe we had, we have one that survived and this one's eating like a champ now. And we're like kind of going back and forth. Should we sell it or should we keep it? Because we weren't planning on keeping it anymore. But like with that kind of dedication to getting it started, you're like, maybe you should keep it. You know? Right? Yeah. It's but, like the uh, price isn't high enough to, to sell that <laughs> animal I put so much effort into. Yeah. But uh, we guess had a clutch uh, from our youngest pair that we got from you of seven eggs. It's our biggest clutch so far. So they're incubating right now. And I'm expecting to see them pip in the next, you know, 14 days or so. So awesome. fingers crossed. This is our yeah. year. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, and I hope, you know, if I can, if I can share any tips, I mean, I, that's the tip I'm going to try this year is the baby food thing. We'll see how that works. But he, he swears by, he said he had really good success and they grew really well. And, did fine. So I'll give it a shot. I'll try anything once. But another uh, trick I, I heard from a colubrid breeder was uh, taking frozen thawed pinks and then putting them in boiling water and having them kind of cook a little. Um, that worked really well for my Western uh, Stimson's pythons. Uh, they were kind of picky and ha I had a hard time getting them started. And I, uh, somebody told me that trick. And so I tried it. And like, I think I had probably 75% of my 30 babies eat just doing that. So I was oh, wow. really, yeah, really happy. I didn't have to assist those anymore. Um, and it's, you know, I got to thaw them out anyway. What's the difference thawing them out in boiling water? So that was a really helpful tip. So it's nice to kind of talk with people and share different ideas and, and tricks and tips. So when you did that, did you just heat them up or did you fully cook them? Well, I, I think it, uh, I mean, to get them to the point where they were thawed, they kind of cooked a little bit, especially on the outside. So I, I imagine it changed the smell a bit. I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't really smell them too, too long or too hard, but <laughs> they, they probably didn't smell the same as just the regularly thawed uh, pinky, but they did kind of have a color change. They were a little more bright red versus kind of that pinkish gray color. So I think mm -hmm. it did, uh, did change, you know, something and cook them a little bit, at least on the outside. Do you want to take them back down? Yeah. So yeah, it, uh, that was a, a, a tip, tip that worked really well. When you, uh, when you say that you're going to um, use like a syringe, um, and we've talked about maybe using catheters, um, mm -hmm. that type of thing, how far in are you planning on putting that tip into the mouth of a, say, are you like going to try to get it into the stomach or are you just trying to, you know, fire hose it in a little bit? Like what's the... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I worried a little bit about that because where the these Antaresia babies are so small, you know, you don't want to go too far. You could potentially perforate the the stomach or something. So yeah, it's it's a big concern. And I think, um, you know, I I went with uh, there was a ten mil like bird syringe on Amazon that I went with, and it had these rubber like silicone. Um, attachments little needle attachments so silicone needles and some were a little too floppy but one was would one had pretty good rigidity and uh, i tried it on a, a baby centralian python that's been kind of a picky feeder and uh it worked pretty well so basically i just put it down um maybe two finger widths on this on this brettles python which is a little bigger so i i don't know that i'd go that deep with an antaresia but and then i kind of put my thumb um, so if the, if the needle went here, I put my thumb there and then put the food in and then pulled the needle out and kind of, you know, held my finger there and kind of massaged it down. So the, the baby food would go down rather than back, but he didn't really try to regurgitate or anything like that. You know, I, 
I don't know if you try to assist feeding tails or legs, but man, half the time they try to spit it back out, which oh, yeah. Yeah, drives you nuts. So <laughs> yeah. that has a ton of experience with that. So <laughs> I've done it only a couple of times. Normally it's Ryan. Yeah. yeah. I'm actually many frustrated nights spending hours trying to get these things. To <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I know that well. Yeah. I, half the time you're just like fine if you want to die go ahead you know that's your choice <laughs> i'm done with you at least for tonight <laughs> yeah yeah i'm looking yeah. up the syringes right now <laughs> put on your own time buddy we're in the middle of this podcast <laughs> Jesus i got the oh. one that had like a green i think it was green no, uh, don't the description now he's going to keep playing on the computer <laughs> tell him afterwards <laughs> This is but, valuable information, man. Yeah, nobody knew. Okay, we'll we'll have a little we'll have a link to it on the um, podcast at the end for everybody. So I, uh, I don't know. I gotta make sure it works first before I uh, recommend it too much. But, yeah. So in the wild, um, what are babies starting on that we're having so much trouble in captivity? Is it like um, a lizard diet? Yeah. Lizards, and and I imagine if I mean I I know some people breed like the. Um, clone geckos or whatever to house you know, geckos and so on and so forth yeah and and i think some species will like are helpful for that i know uh casey lazic he was probably the first one to really breed them in the united states and he said his first clutch like went pretty easy on rodents he's like i don't know what everybody's talking about that was a piece of cake it was really easy but then he said the next year like none of them would eat and they were all refusing for you know any rodent at all and he said one time he just got frustrated i think he said he had like a stillborn uh, uh gecko you know that had slit the egg came out and died you know right after and so he put that in there or something and he said that the thing didn't even hit the ground and this picky pygmy python was all over it you know so they they definitely come out hardwired wanting lizards and uh you know it makes sense there's a you know a billion little lizards over in australia and not a lot of uh, you know mammals running around and, and where they live, so uh, you know makes complete sense that they would look for lizards. Um, plenty of small skinks. Mm -hmm. I've I've tried some of like the lizard scents from some of these. What's the the place that makes like the uh, sausages for some, yeah right to links or whatever? Yeah. I tried. They have like a line of scents, and I tried the lizard scent. I, I saw maybe it, it helped maybe 10% of the time uh, get them get them a little better. I put uh, like shed gecko skin from like a nephurus onto a pinky and that, you know, maybe helped a little bit, but not a ton. Like they were a little more interested. They'd sit and smell it and nose it and stuff. Um, so I think, you know, changing that smell probably will help if, and maybe that's why the boiling worked so well because it, changed it from that, you know, strong rodent smell or whatever to something a little more neutral, maybe. I don't know that, but, uh, you know, they were a lot more inclined to eat that uh, boiled frozen thawed uh, pink than they were just a regular pink or a washed off pink or whatever. So, um, Not but, but yeah, I haven't tried that yet. I've heard, you know, I've heard people using fish or, or fish sand or fish oil or whatever. And I've heard that works, but I don't want to smell like fish oil, so I don't know. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Keep your sardines to yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I have a nomination for the next podcast. We need to actually talk to someone who works for the species that's not trouble feeders, because I feel like every week we're talking about all these tricks and getting these animals to feed on every species we cover since we started the show. You don't want to talk to ball python people. <laughs> well, we're kind of talking to ball python people. I think everyone in this room has ball pythons. <laughs> I, I gave all mine away, so I don't have any more. Is that what you're doing? <laughs> no, no. I was just uh, um, too lazy, I guess. I wanted somebody else to take care of them too for me. Too lazy to work with the laziest species there's ever been. <laughs> yeah. shows, me, shows you how lazy I am, I guess, or, or how focused yep, yep. I am on getting Anteresia babies to feed that I don't even remember to pair my ball pythons up. But, um, you're fourth breed in tails, but you won't do ball pythons. That's great. Because exactly. <laughs> I don't have any more time because I've been forced feeding tails all night. Right? Like After that, I'm exhausted. I just want to go to bed. I don't want to pair up ball pythons. I hear you. <laughs> the, the other – so once – he so Casey gave that uh, – gecko and and the pygmy took it you know without hesitation and he said he i think he fed a few more uh lizards but he saw that uh, there was like a switch that turned once they reached a certain size and you know i don't know what that size is but 
you know, eventually all the enteresia go onto mammals. We, we were actually cruising up in uh, Darwin area and we found a uh, DOR children's python and it had a food bolus. So we kind of squoze it out, worked it out. And uh, it was a rodent of some sort, you know, some kind of rat or mouse or something. Um, but you know, once they hit a certain size, they, they do switch over to mammals. So once you get them big enough, they're, they're, they're I mean, they're the easiest things in the world to feed. <laughs> so I, I was, I, I don't know if you got that. Uh, I think it's, is it Mark O'Shea's book, the giant book of snakes or whatever. And it's that huge fat book. You guys have that one? I've I seen it. I, I don't have it. In the shelf. I don't remember, but yeah, there it is. That's a. Uh, uh, we're in the process of moving, so all my stuff. But this one here, uh, the Book of Snakes everybody? from Mark is O'Shea. It? Like, I don't know. I thought I knew a lot of snakes. Man, I don't think I recognize 90% of the species in that book. There's so many snakes I don't know. And and most of them are like lizard feeders or snake feeders. Some specialize just like on eating blind snakes. You know, they're just all these weird specialized feeders. And I think very few snake species actually eat, you know, rodents in the wild. So um, I guess we're lucky with what we have. So that's probably why the, all the discussion on problem feeders, because they all want, you know, lizards or frogs or blind snakes or some weird food item that's really difficult to get in captivity. And I think, you know, herpers in general aren't really excited to feed lizards to their snakes, you know, because we like mm -hmm. lizards as well. Um, so I don't know. That's probably why, why we get a lot of that discussion. <laughs> yeah. but there's a lot of, a lot of cool snake species. I just, uh, on, on my trip, I collected a couple of ground snakes. They're like this bright orange, black banded things. They're really cool looking, but they're insectivorous. So I've been, you know, I'm trying to get them onto insects. I, I, uh, grabbed a couple uh, Kyanactus occipitalis, the shovel nose snakes, when I was down at the Herpeton Conference, San Diego, went over into Borrego and found a couple uh, shovel nose snakes. And uh, the ones that didn't escape are doing really well, like on dubia and crickets, like they eat them really easy. So, um, wow. you know, uh, an insect eating snake, I think that would be really cool, especially one that has the same pattern as a coral snake. You know, the, the shovel nose snakes are really pretty and they have that yellow black and white banding which is really cool so, or sorry red white and and black but, you know. wow man <laughs> what about uh so can i ask about uh have you seen any blue tongue skinks in the wild um oh that's like that's a sore subject with me <laughs> I, I uh I have, but um, ninety percent of them have been dead on the road. You know, smushed. To, you know, so um, I I did uh, see a couple eastern blue tongues over uh, between uh, Sydney and Brisbane, and uh, it was actually at John Weigel's uh, snake ranch when he used to own Snake Ranch. Um, he let me go up there, and apparently he he would never let any Australians. But if there were you know, tourists coming over, he'd let them go up there. So I actually stayed at Snake Ranch and, and we'd go herping. We went and there were a couple blue tongues just under some log. It was kind of a little chilly and rainy outside. So they were like curled around, but there were two of them just right next to each other curled under this log. It was kind of cool. So I think I think I posted some okay. pictures of those on my website. But um, and then I've I've seen um, uh, some, a bunch of shinglebacks in the wild. There's uh Awesome. Found some, yeah, the uh, we were we my wife and I on our trip we went over to this uh, island just off the coast uh, near Perth that's called Rotnest Island and mm -hmm. it's got these quokkas these little uh, marsupial kangaroo type dealies that are like the size of a cat you know they're cute little faces and they're they're cute little mammals or whatever but uh, we we walk around this island. They have a species of, of blue tongue. Well, it's a subspecies, I guess. Uh, Kanoai, or I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but it's the uh, Rottenest Island blue tongue or shingleback skink. And they have kind of a greenish tint to them. They're really cool looking. Got to look them up. But I I, I posted pictures on my website on uh, that trip. Um, uh, to I think my first trip to Western Australia is when I found those and. I, we just found one, but you know, we, we uh, rented bikes and rode around the island and found one just off the side of the road. I was really excited, but I, <laughs> I, uh, you know, took a picture. They call it a wanker shot over there when you get a picture with an animal holding an animal or whatever. 
take a picture that they, they call it a wanker shot but i got my wanker shot and i have this goofy bike helmet that they <laughs> have you wear when you rent a bike from their company or whatever and so i forgot to take off the helmet when i did my wanker shot so it was like a complete goob, but that yeah, was great um but that was a really cool species to see and just beautiful and you know I uh, did the whole tongue thing and, and displayed really aggressively. And I was thinking, you know, I wonder why I didn't see very many of those. And then like a uh, couple weeks later, I saw some uh, Asian got busted trying to smuggle out like 30 of them, 30 Rottnest Island shingle bags. So I'm like, that's wow. probably why I didn't see many on the island because somebody was trying to smuggle them off. So that was kind of a bummer. But we we saw a few more, like you'd just be driving through a neighborhood, you know, on the outskirts of Perth, and there'd be a shingle back skiing crossing the road, you know, headed over, and you'd stop, and you'd be in somebody's yard just going crazy about this shingle back, and, you know, come out, what are you doing, you idiot? <laughs> it's just a blue tongue, whatever, leave it alone. Um, but I think my favorite uh, shingle back experience was in this place called Pinnacles or Nambung National Park on the coast of... Uh, Western Australia, just maybe if uh, an hour or two north of Perth, and uh, it's it's this like orange yellowy sand with these giant rocks just sticking up out of it, like uh, like gravestones. You know, these big old gravestones just everywhere sticking out. Or some are like pointy and you know castle looking. Um, really cool landscape. And uh, me and my friends were cruising around there, and and. Uh, see these weird tracks and so we start following these tracks and well they belong to blue tongue skinks that were paired up for the spring like chasing each other males chasing the female following her around and so you just follow the tracks to a pair of shinglebacks it was really cool so we just sat and watched them and you know watched them interact i've got some i got some pretty good uh video that i put on my youtube page of, of that and in, in the pinnacles uh video or nambung herping nambung or something like that but um it was really fun to watch those and and uh we we found or steve found it he was the only non-carpet guy there and he found a an a imbricata the southwest carpet python just coiled up right next to one of those pinnacles it was like the ideal location to find something like that you know usually you find them like in a trash bin or you know a trash heap or something on the outskirts of town but this was like prime cool looking habitat and we posed it up on a rock and up on the tree and stuff so it made it look really cool but <laughs> that was kind of fun so that's awesome that was a, that's a cool place though but yeah they the shinglebacks are pretty uh I mean, we one stretch just uh, kind of on the way to close to Nambung National Park. I think we counted thirty shinglebacks that were dead on the side of the road that had been hit by cars. Wow. Um, and you know that's why I guess it's a touchy uh, subject because the only um, Centralian and Western blue tongues that I've seen have been just either recently hit or you know a long time ago hit. Mm -hmm. and, and just were dead on the road. The worst was when they're still twitching and you drive up and some like the car in front of you hit it. And you're like, this is what I've been dreaming of, you know, photographing and interacting with. And now I get to watch it die in front of me. And that's the downside of herping Australia is seeing all these amazing animals just squashed on the road. But I guess that's how Man. it goes. But I guess at the same time, you know, you know, there's healthy populations if you can see 30 of them dead on the side of the road. Either that or they're just really, they don't degrade very quickly because they were <laughs> pretty uh, flat and mummified, but they were still around. So I don't know, maybe that shingle back, uh, the, their thick skin helps them stick around for longer. I hear, I hear that they don't like the laws right now in, in Australia, and so they're just trying to, you know, play in the road. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I think, you know, they. I, I tried to export some Western uh, Stimson's pythons to Europe and that's, you know, there I, I imported them from there and I had all the paperwork from the importation. Everything was done legally. They were imported as Stimsoni Stimsoni, the Western subspecies. So, like, I thought everything was legal, right? You know, they stamped the import documents and let them come in and I got them, you know, and, and bred them. And then I was going to send some back to Europe. And they said, no, nope, sorry, we're not going to issue those permits. And I said, well... Uh, you know, why, why not? And they said, well, we can't tell if they're illegal or not. I said, well, you stamped the doc. Doesn't that make them legal? Your little stamp? <laughs> no, right. sorry. And I said, well, you, you issued, you issued me permits for Stimson. I last year. No, no, we have no record of that. <laughs> I'm like, you have, here it is. I, you know, here's the permit. <laughs> right here. 
well, uh, we have no record of that. I said, well, I do, you know, <laughs> wow. it, it, I, I was just pulling my hair out. I don't know what to do with those, those guys. So I, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not worth the effort just because you never know what, what rules they're going to follow or not. So I've just been trying to sell them around here instead of exporting them, but yeah, frustrating. Or there's a market around here for them. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So um, before you were talking about um, blue tongue skinks on the road, I don't know what statistic I heard in the past, but um, tens of or not, well, tens of thousands, I think, die on the road there every year. And I think that was an argument when they're like, you know, why can't we export these things? Um, 25,000 are dying on the roads there every year. They have too many of them anyways. You know, we're all greedy and we want them. So any excuse to get them over, any random thing to throw at people. But yeah, no, that's tragic. Uh, if I went all the way to Australia and only saw a bunch of dead cell trillions or westerns on the road, um, I'd be sad. I might not ever go back again. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's that's some of the motivation that may, keeps me going back because I, I want to see them. So that's one of the target species for this trip in October is the westerns. And I've got some, you know, areas that I've been told that are, they're a little easier to find. So hopefully I'll be lucky this time and be able to see a live one. But uh, yeah, it's it's tragic. And, you know, they, they told me with, with that uh, Western Stimson's Python export permit that they denied, they said, well, we have to do a study to see how this will impact wild populations. And I said, what in the world are you talking about? How this will imp These are captive bred multi-generation. They're going to benefit wild populations because nobody will need to smuggle them because I'm sending over captive bred babies. Like, what are you, you know, I said, I saw more Stimson's pythons dead on the road than I want to export. You know, what, what are you talking about? You have no clue what you're doing. I was, I, I kind of, yeah, uh, wasn't very happy with that lady. But. And now you're not allowed in the office anymore. It's a mess. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe that's why I'm not applying for any more permits because they <laughs> probably banned me for life or something. But <laughs> So you spent a good uh, amount of your life and effort, um, studying Australian species so much so that you co-wrote books and I think uh, we talked about you having another one about ch children's pythons coming out that you're editing or something um I've, I've been, correctly, oh sorry go ahead I'm just saying if I'm remembering our conversation correctly at Tinley <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I've, I've got a, a book on nephurus and the, their relative underwoodosaurus uvidicolus um, the, the knobtail geckos and barking geckos. So that one we're putting the finishing touches on. Um, we've got eco, uh, Bob Ashley and Russ, um, laying that out. So hopefully we'll have that, uh, ready to go soon. I was going to hopefully unveil it at Tinley, but the, I think the trip to Australia is at the same time as Tinley. So I don't know if I'll, be there. but if the, Trip to Australia gets canceled due to COVID, then I'll be at Tinley, uh, hopefully <laughs> unveiling a book. So that'll be nice. But yeah, it should. I, I don't know. The goal with these books is to show kind of a, a huge um, photographic record of as many locality uh, specimens that we can find, you know, photographs that we can get and um, which, you know, makes it very picture heavy. But we also uh, have kind of the first half or two thirds of the book. Uh, focused on their natural history, what they do in the wild, you know, kind of give people a better understanding of them, uh, how they came to be where they are, things like that. We have like uh, different different uh, chapters on, you know, what they're doing, their reproduction in the wild, things like that. So when people uh, keep them in captivity, they understand, you know, their where where they're coming from and what they're doing, so they can maybe replicate some of that or meet some of their needs that they have in in the wild. Um, so we can hopefully keep them better in captivity. Um, I just think, you know, every time I've seen a species in the wild, I've learned, you know, something from it just by watching it or, or seeing, even just seeing the environment that it's in. Um, I really like those, the series that Dave Kaufman's doing where he shows, you know, here it is, here's its habitat, here's the temperatures, humidity. Um, uh, that's really important information, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, uh, that's just, uh, that's, that makes those trips over to Australia just very important for me because most of the species I keep are from there. So uh, I need to know, you know, what they need and how to, uh, better meet their needs in, in, in a captive setting. So. Yeah, that's awesome. 
but we we're we're working on we we sold out of the first edition of the carpet python book and we're working on a second edition of that book so that one should be out hopefully by the end of the year we're trying to uh, that the carpet complex is is kind of a um difficult topic just because you know it's hard to know where all the species subspecies splits uh go and and you know what's what and things like that so we're we're doing a little genetic work with uh with warren booth and trying to you know figure out some of the structure within the carpet python complex there's a few uh publications and groups over in australia that have done a little of that and pretty interesting stuff so we're trying to make sense of that trying to figure out how to how to you know divide up these different uh, groupings of carpet pythons in in a meaningful way? Um, you know, for example, your co coastal carpets and jungle carpets um, are probably not really different. They probably shouldn't be separate subspecies, at least um, where they occur near each other in in northern Australia. Those are probably the same thing, but. There is a difference between those and further up north uh, populations as well as uh, southern populations. So, you know, that's makes it difficult. You know, you, I mean, if you sync those two together, but they're still different than the ones down here, do you have to rename these or, you know, we're not really taxonomists. So, you know, I don't know that we're going to be really doing any of that basic science work of, of giving things names, but we're going to propose some, you know, change ups that might uh be hard to take for a lot of you know hardcore carpet people <laughs> to, to mm -hmm. see some of these changes to stuff they've uh grown up uh you know uh, learning or knowing i i mean taxonomy is something that just changes at the drop of a hat and it, you know even sometimes at people's whims you know if they think something's different then they you know slap on a new name or something and sometimes that's hard we when we were down in uh uh, Southern Utah, I was, uh, we saw some chuckwallas and, and I had it in my mind that their scientific name was Saramalis obesus, right? And it made sense because they're so fat, you know, obese. But uh, when, when, they, when I, they were like, oh, there's a Saramalis ater, ater or whatever. And I'm like, I don't remember it being that. Like I had it in my mind that it's obesus. And they're like, no, it's adder. And so I, you know, I checked uh, the, the web when I got home and it, it was so our malus obesus in like 1985 in the Stebbins guidebook, and then it changed to adder later on. I think the original description was adder, and they thought uh, obesus was like a subspecies in certain areas, but then they sunk them all together, so now they're all adder instead of obesus. So mm -hmm. <laughs> just it can be it can be a headache if you you haven't looked at a species for a while. You know, all the taxonomy can change overnight. Um, they just changed the uh, Owen Pelly python again. Uh, they had taken it out of Morelia and put it with the scrubs in Somalia. And then somebody came along and did some additional work with uh, genetics and, and such. And they found that it was more closely allied to the carpet python clade again. But it was, you know, basal enough that they gave it a different genus name. And, and they named it Nawaran, uh, the genus Nawar, put it, put oh, and Pelensis in, in the genus Nawaran. But, uh, Wells and Wellington back in 1981 had designated a genus for Owen Pelensis, which was like Nick to Tifla Python or some weird name like that. And so now there's this split on whether or not they're going to accept Nawaran or they're going to go by the original Nick to Tifla Python uh, genus. And so I don't know. We're the only reason I, I'm paying that much attention is because we're, we're considering putting maybe a chapter in the carpet book uh, for Owen Pelly's because where mm -hmm. else are they going to go if they're not with the scrubs, you know? So I thought it might be fitting since we have like uh, rough scale pythons in the book as well. So we'll see, <laughs> but just, I, I don't know. Sometimes the, the taxonomy makes me want to pull my hair out, but what do you do? So why don't we uh, switch gears a little bit and uh, have a, a fun question sure. and, uh, and not that this hasn't been fun. I mean, it is, but maybe something. <laughs> so what was uh, the craziest time? And it doesn't necessarily have to be like reptile related, but like you go on all these herping trips and you got to be like crammed in with friends or like, you know, what do you guys do to like blow off steam and have like a good time? And like one of your stories that you're like, Oh man, we're in this bar and, <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, and these guys just wanted to fight because we're American. I don't know. 
whatever. <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't be afraid to talk about furries either. That kind of comes up every once in a while. <laughs> we, I, I don't know that I have any uh, too crazy stories uh, about 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 the uh, bar fights or anything. But um, we were we were driving through uh, Perth once, and and uh, we saw this car broke or broke or on the side of the road. I think the guy actually had just gotten in an accident because he had drunk a little bit too much. And so we stopped to see if he needed help. And my friend rolls down the window. He's like, can we help you? Do you need any help? And the guy's like, you laughing? And he's like, what? He said, you laughing? He's like, no, I'm offering help. And he's like, uh, I'm good. He thought we were just rolling down the window to laugh at him. And uh, so I guess he didn't need our help. But um me and uh, Steve and Mike were driving through Western Australia, and I, you, you know, the road trains—they're like semis with like three different cars behind them. Um, so we went to pass a road train, and it took me so long. So I'm driving, you know, trying to get past it, and all of a sudden, you know, we're rounding this curve, and all of a sudden, there's a road train coming right at us, and like I couldn't, I couldn't get over in time to to get, you know, past the first road train we we're passing. So I had to go off on the shoulder and like, you know, bump down off the road. And my friends just looking at me like, what are you doing? We like almost died, you know? So, but luckily there was like a big Panoptes monitor right off the road there. So we got to go chase that and forget we almost died and go chase a big lizard. Um, that was on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I saw this, I saw the lizard there. So I pulled off the road to go chase him. But um, I think the scariest thing was, uh, uh, this same group, me and my two buddies were up in Karajini and we found this canyon that was like, uh, you know, adventure time or whatever you go. There's like this, uh, you're going through water, right? And then there's this place where you slide on the rock and then fall like 20 feet into a pool of water. And, you know, so I thought, oh, that looks cool, right? So I'm doing my research on this canyon, trying to find all the information I can. And it says, you know, you need all this gear or whatever. But Australians are kind of notorious for um, making, thing, making things sound more dangerous than they really are. Um, my wife and I were going on this hike, and there was, like, this big sign, that, warning, if you don't have class four climbing experience, do not attempt this 0.1 kilometer, you know, trail or something and, and my wife's just going oh i'm not doing that i'm like it's 0.1 kilometers like you know it's and i think like the the most dangerous thing involved was like climbing a ladder or something you know it's just <laughs> you know you needed class four climbing skills to get down the ladder apparently so i was thinking ah you know they're just being uh over protective or something so so we go off you know this water slide and go down into the pool of water and we're all you know high five and then thinking it's the coolest thing. And then we get down to the next drop. Well, the, the pool's not deep enough just to jump into. It's only about knee or thigh high. And so this was the part where you needed ropes or repelling gear or whatever. And I was thinking, ah, uh, I, I watched a video and it looked like you could kind of down climb on the rocks and stuff. So I'm thinking we're probably okay. I brought a rock, I brought a rope, like just a hardware store rope and some leather gloves just in case. Um, and so we get there and I, I look over and it was like a complete like overhang. There was no way you could climb down the rocks. It was like a straight fall 20 feet. And I was thinking, you know, 20 feet's not that bad. But when you're looking down 20 feet, it's, it's a, it's a little bit of a height, you know? And so I'm thinking, crap, I just led us to our death. You know, we're going to be stuck here. They're going to find three skeletons at the edge of this little waterfall thing. Um, so I'm just just thinking what how are we going to get out of this one you know and, and so i thought well uh my like my mouth went instantly dry and i'm just like i need water <laughs> give me water i gotta figure this out so um i i thought well maybe i'll, I'll loop the rope through so it's doubled up over they had some chains you know for repellers or whatever so i looped the rope over that and i just thought i'll just slide down it like a fire you know a fire station pole or whatever and so i i tried it out you know there was like this um you kind of since it was an overhang, I had to like get out over the edge and I found a foothold. So I'm kind of trying to hold onto the rope, commit, but you have to commit to get that foothold. So I get the foothold and then I can grab with both hands and slide and it worked. And I was like, okay, we're saved, you know, uh, and good end to the story. Well, uh, my second friend, Mike, he, he did the same thing, you know, slid down 
he had his GoPro going for his, so you know, but he didn't want to film me just in case I died or something. He didn't want to have my <laughs> death on record. But um, so he was filming his, and then Steve was the last one to go. Now Steve's like six foot three, big guy. You know, he, he uh, he's like, I don't feel comfortable doing this. <laughs> and like right before we'd gone down the point of no return, he's like, I don't have a good feeling about this. I'm like. I have a great feeling. Do you want the keys? You can go back to the car. I'm doing this, you know? And uh, he's like, no, I'll do it. But just let the record show that I, I, I don't think this is a good idea. And uh, sure enough, he's like, yeah, I don't think I can do that. And I'm like, well, do you want to wait here? And, you know, we'll come back with some real ropes or something in a couple of days, you know? I don't know what to do. Um, and so he's like, well, I'd feel better if you could belay me. I'm like, uh, this rope's not meant for belaying people. You know, it's like a hardware store rope. I said, the best I can do, I'll, you know, I'll make a little uh, loop for you to sit on. I'll try to, I'll try to slow your fall. So basically get in the loop, hold on to the rock, you know, get that foothold and then hold the rope and I'll just let you descend and I'll try to slow your fall. And he's like, okay. I said, don't put any strain on the rope, you know, uh, you see where this is going. So he gets out on the edge and I, I don't know if he got nervous or what, but he kind of like jumped and grabbed the rope and swung and the rope sliced oh, on the rock and it snapped and he just fell and landed on his side. And he's like, my leg, my leg is broken. We're like, oh, awesome. This is fantastic news. So we're like, well, what are we going to do now? You know, because we still had to go through the canyon and then climb back out at the exit point another couple miles down, down the stream. And luckily it was mostly water. And I brought these little inflatable tubes to kind of sit in and float down the water. And so, and I, I swam like I'm a swimmer. So I uh, put him in the tube and then just kind of pushed him along in the water and 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 so luckily you know he didn't have to walk a lot every once in a while there was some land and you have to walk over and then get back on the tube and he was kind of limping gingerly but we didn't think it was broken because he was able to put weight on it and walk on it to some extent but it was not pleasant for him so then we get to the the end of this uh canyon to the exit point and and I'm thinking, well, I'll go scout ahead and see if I can find the trail because we we weren't, you know, weren't totally sure, you know, which way to uh, get out or which way to go because there was no real trail marked. I just I had a map, but I had it in this dry bag, and the dry bag leaked, so the map was all wet and fell apart. So I'm trying to piece together the map to try to figure out where to you know exit and stuff. So I get up at the top, and I'm like, I see no trail. I see nothing. I'm like, what? what are we going to do? You know, we're going to, again, three skeletons out in the spin effects. And so I start looking around. And I, I noticed these like little uh, ribbons hanging from the trees, like surveyor ribbons or something. And so I kind of started seeing them go like in a line. So I'm like, oh, maybe that's the trail. <laughs> and so I started following them. And sure enough, it led to this road. So I run back and we grab Steve and Mike and Steve's hobbling along. So we get to this road and we're like, okay, you know, right or left, which way do we go? And we picked left because it seemed like it would take us to the edge of the canyon where the car uh, parking lot was. And uh, so we're walking along. And I don't know if you guys know what spin effects is. It's this, like, gr it looks like a clump of grass, but mm -hmm. each blade of the grass is like a rigid spine, like a cactus uh, spine, like a long, you know, spear or whatever. One time I threw a little baby carrot and it just stuck, you know, right on <laughs> one of those spears. And so if you kick one, it's not a very pleasant experience. So, you know, we're trying to weave through the spin effects and walk down this road and it's overgrown, you know. And uh, we get, we, we were walking along the road and all of a sudden the road just ended in the middle of nowhere. We're like, awesome. <laughs> I guess it was right instead of left. So we had to turn around and walk all the way back. And Steve just like, ah, oh, ah. But uh, we, we did find a Stimson's Python on that road. And so that was hey, a there you go. bonus. <laughs> but the, you know, the other way did eventually lead to the parking lot. And I wasn't a skeleton. So I did make it out in case you're worried. So. Yeah. I, was, he I was on the edge of my seat wondering if yeah. you know, <laughs> whether whether we made it out or not. We did have to leave Steve for dead, but I'm sure he's okay. Where he was the whiner anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he did all right. He I, he probably he was pretty mad at me for a little bit, but <laughs> he's he's a good sport, I guess. But yeah, um, we um. Did he well, break his leg? 
he he didn't end up breaking it. It wasn't broken, so that was a very very fortunate thing. Yeah. But he did, he did have some discomfort for the rest of the trip, so that was kind of rough. You know, he's hobbling around a little bit. But, but he has a story. What's well, that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. He got he got his uh, adventure story in Australia. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm like, hey man, you got to listen to those, you know, those thoughts. If you don't think it's a good thought, you better <laughs> turn back next time. <laughs> now we knew I what. Personally, um, I just wouldn't invite him with you anymore. Like, <laughs> friends like that. I mean, I'm sorry. I just, I'd leave him behind. Oh, uh, he's, he's too good a friend. I, I don't know. I'd, I'd hurt with him again. Yeah, I guess the thing that bugged me the most about Steve and Mike is as soon as it was dark and in, in Western Australia, it got dark at 6 PM. They'd be out like a light. We'd be driving like night cruising. And they'd be asleep, and I'm like driving alone. <laughs> hey guys, there's a gecko. You want to wake up to look at it, or do you want to sleep? <laughs> you know. <laughs> After we've seen three or four, they're like, "Oh, we're good. We saw we saw three already." <laughs> I'm like, "Come on, you know, you can sleep when you get home." So, but that was that was the most frustrating. And you know, I get, I'll give him a pass because Steve was he had a cold like for for a uh, few days during the first part of the trip. So I'll give him a little bit of a pass. But <laughs> I was like, "Come on, you guys," you know. And I'd be driving like, so I had nobody to help keep me awake. So I'm just like slapping myself, rolling down the window. And uh, I, I'm like driving through the middle of Western Australia and I'm just like dead tired, but I'm trying to make it to the spot so we can go look around at night. Cause I want to see a, a Baron's olive python out in Karajini. And uh, like, I'm just driving and I look over and I see like these rows of corn and there's like these gardens with like tomatoes and stuff. I'm like, oh, that's a nice garden, you know. Maybe if we get hungry, we can grab a an ear of corn or something. And I'm like, wait a second, we're in the middle of nowhere. There's no garden. I'm like hallucinating from <laughs> just trying to stay awake too long. So I'm like, okay, it's probably safer if we pull over and sleep. So <laughs> <laughs> when you start seeing phantom tomatoes, that's probably the sign. Yeah, you know? phantom tomatoes <laughs> are a bad sign. Hallucinations are not good. <laughs> but, yeah, some are good. <laughs> <laughs> some people pay good money for those hallucinations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think I ate any mushrooms or anything on the you know on my sandwiches over there. <laughs> they do, wrong then. Yeah, they do put some weird stuff on the burgers though. They if Vegemite? you <laughs> no Vegemite, <laughs> but they if you go to Australia, ask for the you know the Aussie burger with the lot. And they put like an egg and a slice of pineapple and like a big piece of Canadian bacon and a big giant slice of beetroot, like beets, <laughs> like pickled beet. Wow. Um, yeah, it's 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 not bad, but yeah, it's kind of a it's it's a cool thing. That's something you got to do if you go over there is get an Aussie burger with a lot. <laughs> Sounds good. Oh yeah. So I'm um, talking food. Um, so you've been working with Blue Tongues for a while now. Um, you know, diet in this industry, it seems like everyone's kind of doing their own thing. Some people are being really successful with it. Other people are not. Um, what are you doing for your Blue Tongue diet? Um, so I've, I've done quite a few different things. And uh, so I, when I started out keeping them, basically I, I got Northern Blue Tongues to practice for Westerns because somebody told me that if you can do well with Northerns that you can do well with Westerns. And uh, so I, you know, I read all the same literature you guys all read uh, as far as what to feed a blue tongue. And so I kind of made up my own concoction. I took some wet dog food and ground up some veggies, you know, uh, some green leaf lettuce and some maybe a couple like an apple or something and, and some carrots and other veggies. And then uh, just mixed it up in a big vat and like froze down little pieces that I could thaw out and give to my blue tongues as I went. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a lot of work and, and a lot of hassle and I had to take up a lot of room in, in the freezer. So uh, I, I guess I and, and I went over to, to Australia and visited a few of the really successful blue tongue breeders over there. And uh, um, a lot of them were, you know, they had like a dry um, cat chow or dog chow mix in in the in the cage at all times, kind of in a little dog bowl. So the skinks could snack on that if they wanted. And then they would feed uh, veggies and um, like a wet uh, dog food or, or cat food, depending on the age of the skinks, um, kind of intermittently. And so I said, that sounds like a nice way to do it. It seems like a very easy way to do it. And, I, and I've read on diets of blue tongue skinks in the wild and they 
pretty much eat anything that they think is edible, right? So they mm-hmm. they eat, and and I think you know things vary seasonally. I, I I'm thinking about doing some uh, seasonal variation. You know, maybe having more insects or or protein, you know, uh, mice or something during certain parts of the year, and then switching over to more veggies uh, later in the year, something like that after their babies are born. But kind of mixing it up a little to kind of replicate maybe a natural diet. Um, but basically I, I feed them, try to feed them a varied diet. I've used the, like the bluey, Rapashi bluey buffet and some of those, uh, powdered diets. Um, they like the, the, what is it? Bug burger or whatever the, the mm-hmm. meat eater grub, one. Pie? grub pie. Yeah. They like that. They like that one. I usually mix that one to one with, uh, the, uh, veggie burger or whatever the veggie, um, like the bearded dragon mix. So, um, but I found my Westerns really like insects a lot. And, uh, and I'll offer, usually offer, cause I'll feed, I, I breed my own rodents for the snakes. And so I'll offer them like a rat fuzzy or, or a mouse fuzzy, uh, once a week, give them, give them a little, uh, vertebrate in their diet. So, um, and that seems to, you know, give them plenty of protein. So I don't know. They've, they've done well for me though. I think I've gotten most of them to to most of my females to produce every year. So, you know, they must be somewhat supported and the babies seem to do all right. But Yeah. I feel like honestly, and um, I know we've talked about it, at least us guys have talked about it. So when it comes to breeding blue tongues, I feel like I remember a time where I only had like mid twenties and I had a very high success rate. And now we have over 200 and my success rate has gone down. Um, yeah still trying to figure out exactly why this species is so hard to mass produce it's probably something simple that we're overlooking on our end um honestly some of the more established good breeder males i had when i first started doing this they were just ugly as sin and got replaced with somebody a little prettier that turned out not to be a good breeder but um you know diet is something we've played with a lot over the years Uh, i've talked to don patterson a good bit hopefully this isn't a secret of his and i'm giving it to everybody but he's been doing um beef liver and he finds that the animals really love it. There's a lot of different nutrients in it. There's even vitamin C in it. And he says it out of everything he's offered them, they've enjoyed that more than anything else. Yeah. Um, nothing refuses. So we're a little <laughs> hesitant about ever really changing the diet because the diet's always worked for us. And, you know, there's been people in the industry that have made changes and it's been tragic. So um, I'm always yeah. looking for new tips to do, but I'm also scared shitless to ever do anything different. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I, I don't know, I was listening to a podcast that uh, Brian Barczyk, I think it was the, uh, maybe it was the one that Forrest did, um, uh, but he was talking about, you know, his his business and kind of how he grew his, his business, but he said, you know, the economics of, you know, 100 versus 1,000 animals, you know, sometimes you think, okay, if I multiply my number of animals by 10, I'm going to have 10 times the profits as well. And somehow it doesn't work out that way. And I found the same thing. Like the more projects I get, the I guess overall less successful I am. So I, I hear what you're saying with, you know, going from 20 to, to, to 200 is, is kind of a tricky thing to do. And was it overnight just for the record? Yeah. That was oh, a yeah. building process over five or six years <laughs> yeah. on top of it. But, um, and you know, you are right. I mean, when you have too much in front of you, sometimes it's really hard to focus, especially when you work with a lot of different species. But, um, yeah, I feel like I'm stubborn as hell. Um, and you know, I, I talked to Bill Brand a little bit, who's, you know, a really intelligent guy in the industry and he's been working on blue tongues himself. Mm-hmm. Um, he's run into some of the same problems we are when it comes to making a lot of these all in one season, but mm-hmm. You know, we did a lot right this year. Um, you know, Cheryl put a hell of an effort into it this year. We did all the diet the way we wanted to. Three blocks per female. We used as many males as possible. Mm-hmm. And our percentage, again, was considerably lower than where I thought we were going to be considering. I felt like it went really well this year. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we're still trying to figure out exactly what we're doing wrong. It could be something simple. Um, talking to Chris um, Cupper a few weeks ago on how they're doing things in Australia, I thought it was pretty educational. Um, now one thing that he does and it's something more done with Easterns is he's heating them up and he was talking upwards of 110 degree hotspots sometimes before mm-hmm. putting them in the breeding. And, you know, with a lot of species we worked with, um, 
cooking sperm is always a big, you know, fear of mine when it comes to anything. And we blamed one bad year we had on it because mm-hmm. we ran the males a lot hotter. Mm. But um, no, with your boys, I mean, like I said, it's such an easy species to work with. It's honestly, a lot of people say it's difficult. I think it's probably the easiest thing I've ever bred, <laughs> yeah. but um, just having a lot of trouble breeding them in numbers. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I wonder if it's something we're, we're not uh, realizing, you know, just when you're talking about that, I'm thinking, could there be something, you know, to do with pheromones or something, you know, in the air for if uh, they're typically maybe more solitary species, except when they might pair up or something. I wonder if the mix of just a lot of animals in a, in a smaller space could, could uh, contribute to that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I have like, you know, three or four pairs. I don't have a ton of animals. So, you know, I'm not, I, I don't have any experience with large numbers of blue tongues, but I, you know, I think it's, uh, it, there's, there's a lot of things it could be. And that's the hard thing is, you know, figuring that out, but it, that's um, something thing, that came to mind. Um, pheromones, you know, that's actually something Cheryl brought up recently because, you know, I think our male to female ratio is not the best. It's probably like one male to two to three females right now, but then we get breeding and half our males don't want to breed every year. Um, mm-hmm. Some that bred the year beforehand won't breed this year. And, you know, we're causing us to have to do like 1.4, 1.5, which has been proven in the past not to work for us. Um, I had a male back in the day. His name was Bam Bam. I could put him on 10 females every year, and I got mm-hmm. eight winners every single year out of him. But mm-hmm. he was fucking ugly, and I got rid of him. <laughs> uh, but he was the best breeder I've ever had. Some mistakes have been made. Yeah. But, um, yeah, pheromones, you know, we've even talked about maybe, like, dividing the males up into different sections of the house this year for cool down. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe not having so many in one room might help us. But, um, like I said, there's a way to break the code on this thing. Um, I'm not willing to say these things can't be produced in numbers, and I'm sure Bill's the same as me on this one. But, um, you know, who is it? Um, you know, Ray Gurgis had the best year so far in the United States. I want to say his best year was – over 300 babies, I think, was the best he's ever done. Maybe mid-300s one year, and that was about three seasons ago. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, you talk to him about it, and again, you know, he's great at what he does. It's an art form, but I don't know what the fuck he's doing different that we're doing different, that it's just not working for us, but it's working for him, you know? Well, how many litters is that? I mean, is that, I guess, do you know what his percentage of success is with how many females he's got? So. <laughs> yes. No, I, mean, no, no, I you can just say you don't know, Dave. You don't have to just hang on. <laughs> oh, he just came back. Sorry. Sorry. It was, it was a finger slip. I kind of <laughs> did something and now I was gone. But um, I, didn't, You're excited. It's fine. I don't know how many he has exactly. And, you know, a lot of his litters tend to be 10 plus babies. Um, You know, we've been getting 10 plus babies quite a bit. Um. I'd have to actually ask him. I mean, he's got a lot of blue tongues, yeah. but I don't know. Maybe he's only getting 50%. Maybe he's getting less than 50% that year. Um, you know, it seems like with his collection, too, a lot of those were virgin animals that year that he had raised up for a few years. So, hmm. you know, it could have been the fact that there was less older stock and new, more newer babies that were just ready to go. Yeah. But um, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm stubborn. We're going to figure it out. I just um, we haven't figured it out yet. Well, and I, you know, thinking about like shinglebacks, and I, I think some of the blue, I don't know if if much has been looked at as far as uh, their reproductive um, strategies in the wild. I mean, we know a lot about shinglebacks because they're easier to study, and they kind of do that pair bond thing. I, you know, you wonder if uh, may, maybe you're on to something where you're, you know, overrunning your males. You need more males, uh, just. To handle the females but where you said you've had one that can breed you know 10 females no problem um you know and there could be some inbreeding depression going on where the more we produce these things and the nicer animals we get probably represent those that are maybe somewhat inbred or or maybe have a little less uh you know that that vigor that we get sometimes without crossing so maybe bringing in new lines but it looks like, i mean you guys have a pretty diverse collection from all over so I, I, I don't know, you know, it's just some ideas off the top of my head, but you know, maybe as we, we select these really nice looking ones, like you said, the ugly males more, maybe represent more uh, normal wild type animals and they have less of that inbreeding uh, depression or something. 
Yeah, we, um, and, you know, you've probably seen it in a few of the pictures, like, especially with the stuff we got from Jeff Green, the red line stuff, um, you know, we outbred that to the most plastic animals for the most part of our collection and then bred them back to some of the red animals. And, you know, we have a very high success rate, actually, with that project. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the prettiest ones that we have got and some of the prettiest ones we have produced in the past tend to be shitty breeders. It could be too much line breeding. We have to take it a step back, bring it back again. But... Like I said, our, our numbers are not terrible. Um, you know, I'm definitely always happy to see us produce skinks. And, you know, we get quite a few every year. But um, with the amount of females that we're running every year, we always feel like we should be getting more. But mm -hmm. uh, next year, hopefully, it'll be a little different. We're talking about doing a few changes. Um, you know, we are doing rack systems um, mm -hmm. just because the convenience of it. Uh, we've been using the air rest rack systems with the window in the front, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, a lot more like it in the tub. Animals, you know, they like to go up to the front and watch you. But we might switch to cages this year. Um, get UV in there. Um, talking about putting the hot spot in there with the basking bulb. It's going to take up a lot more space. But, you know, one of my favorite setups ever was Jeff Green's room. Just wall to wall cages with blue tongue skinks in it. So, yeah. you know, we found a cage that we really like. It's um, cost effective. And, um yeah, over the next few months, we're going to talk about maybe making the big switch from rack systems to cages this year and see if that makes a difference. Yeah, that's what I've I, I've uh, used is I've, I've had some in racks and I just haven't been happy with it. But I usually I keep uh, the majority of my adults in, in cages with basking lights and um, it gets fairly cool. I, I don't know if that's as important for the northerns as it is for the westerns, but you know, I, I have a drop in the into the 60s or 50s sometimes in my room in the winter, and so I, you know, I, uh, I don't know. There's a lot of a lot of factors that go into it, but I, I'm sure you'll figure it out at some point. But yeah, who knows what what what's going on? But yeah. we're just gonna keep on adding more males every year at this point. I'm not even trying to hold back females anymore. I just want to hold back males. Yeah. Well, now how are you able to select or, or figure out if they're males or females? So. <laughs> Okay, well, we don't. Um, that's the reality, and you know that too. It's just a guessing game. And, you know, a few years ago, we bought that really nice, um, I can't even remember exactly. Okay, so we bought the LED flashlight. We tried to do like with Bearded Dragons where you can um, candle the tail and see if you can yeah. see anything. You know, that didn't work very well. Um, w okay, I don't want to talk about it because it hasn't happened yet, but, um, you know, I was talking with Warren Booth at the Arlington show. We were having a drink. And he was discussing the possibility of doing the same thing they're doing with green tree pythons where they can sex them based on the shed. Yeah. So we've actually held back all the samples he would possibly need to kind of start that process. We haven't sent him the samples yet, but um, that might be an option if that works out. Um, he seemed pretty gung ho about it, um, mm -hmm. you know, willing to help out. You know, he is a busy guy, so I don't want to throw too much at him, but <laughs> You know, in a perfect world, he already knows the lab that um, Barcheck was working with years ago to maybe do the same thing. So, you know, maybe in the next year we'll have something in the United States where we could test by shed and, you know, yeah. enough. But, yeah, right now it's just hold back the prettiest ones and hope the sex ratio is in our favor. But this species in general, we hold back a lot, and I find that um, the ratios are normally very heavy on females. Um, at least that's what we found on our end, and I think Ray was the same way. And I would say probably two out of four skinks that are three out of four skinks that I get from Ray typically end up being female. Hmm. Yeah. I, um, I, I guess I've seen similar results. Um, I, I also put in a plug for, uh, Ben Morrill. He's, uh, we used to be business partners back when he lived in Utah and he's, he owns uh, reptile genetic services. He does the test for, uh, colubrids and venomous. He has a, um, uh, something that he, or, same kind of thing. You send in a shed skin piece and he can uh, determine the gender of the snake through that. So um, I've sent him a number of skink uh, sheds as well from known sexes. And so, you know, he might split up the samples you got, send half to Warren and half to Ben, <laughs> double our chances that we get a, a test for uh, skink gender. But yeah. I'll get talking with you after this. Like I said, we held back everything from a mother to the grandmothers to the great great grandmothers to the babies, all related, unrelated, everything known sexed, and we're hoping that's going to get us somewhere. 
And and if we send it to both of them, then that'll put a fire under both of them to compete, you know, so they might do it faster. <laughs> well, I feel like Warren was doing me a big favor on this one to even consider making time. He didn't ask for anything yet, but if he does, I'll be happy to take care of him. But um, yeah, fuck it. Let's put people against each other and ruin my friendship. I'm all about yeah, it. Yeah, capitalism. Let's do it. <laughs> no, I, I, I like Warren as well. He's He's doing some work for our carpet book, so don't take up his time doing your skink stuff, man. Yeah, we don't want to fuck around now. Yeah, let's focus on important stuff. Now we're about what our sex for our skink is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, so, um, I got to ask, just because I'll never write a book personally. It's just not for me. Um, you know. But if you did, it would be epic, by the way. It would be the worst fucking book ever. <laughs> it would be a picture I'm book. It would be hours and hours of gibberish. Um, you know. <laughs> Maybe that's good. There's a demographic for that out there, but no, I'm not going to do that ever in my life. But um, so Howard what, Stern what, wrote a book. Who what? Howard Stern wrote a book, and it was a uh, very popular. You'd be alright. I mean, he's a pretty smart man. I mean, you know, dick humor to the side. I don't. I don't see why you should be surprised that he wrote a book. Um, Listen, I'm I'm giving you a compliment. I was riding you hard last week. I'm trying to, you know. Did you ride me hard last week? I thought you were nice to me last week. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean so do people come to you and say hey let's do this um you know when it came to the first book that you did in the industry was that something you just did on your own and just went with it or was it a team of people um so the first book i wrote was the complete carpet python and i co-wrote that with nick mutton and uh i think we were just having a conversation you know fellow carpet weirdos talking about snakes and and he said that uh somebody had tried attempted to write a carpet python book and you know they they had some strife within the writing partnership and and ended up just kind of calling it quits and i said well maybe we should pick up the reins and write that book you know and nick said oh yeah why not you know well let's let's do it and so i called up bob ashley said you interested if we if we wrote it instead of these other guys and he said yeah i don't care who writes it just get me a book and so we we uh, worked on it, wrote it, and I mean, it's a it's a process. I mean, it, it takes takes a lot of time, especially if that's not you know the only thing you're doing. Got a uh, five kids and a wife, and you know a full time job and snakes on the side. So uh, you know, I I usually would write when I was on the bus ride into work, and you know have that time to maybe twenty minutes, thirty minutes a day to to sit and read and write uh, some of my th thoughts down. But I mean, it does take a lot of work, especially like uh, when we're a lot of the book was, is based on uh, research, you know, primary papers. And so digging through all the literature and stuff like that can be a little tedious and slow going. And so, I mean, it helps that I work at a university and, you know, I write papers for, for my day job. And so, um, I kind of was familiar with how the, you know, that stuff goes and I had access to all any kind of scientific literature through my library. If they didn't have it at the library, they could uh, get a copy of it from other libraries through an interlibrary loan system. I even brought in a, a PhD thesis from Australia and I think I brought that one in on my own and they got mad at me because I should have done it through the library or something, but it was okay because I had it in hand, so I didn't care uh, how I got it. But um, so yeah, I had that access, and then I thought kind of the purpose of the books, at least in my mind, was to kind of bring the the research um, that was out there to the keeper, so we could kind of have it in a digestible form and put it all together for a certain species or group of species. Um, I, I I think the biggest uh, example of that is the green tree python. I think people had so many people had a misconception of what they needed and what kind of animals they were. You know, think, oh, rainforest, you know, they need 90 degree, you know, they need to be sprayed every day, that kind of thing. And, you know, that's couldn't be farther from the truth. They're small python in a, you know, rainforest that rarely gets above 70 degrees. Um, and they're, you know, do certain things. They're moving all the time instead of just sitting on a perch. So, you know, the animal you see in somebody's box in their reptile room is much different from the one you see out in the wild. And so, um, you know, kind of getting people to understand that natural history is kind of the goal of the books. And, um, but you know, it, it took me, I think this gecko book I've been working on on and off, uh, for the last seven years or so. And granted wow. that was, uh, 
a little bit of a journey. I've had kind of a couple of co-author changes on that one. And, uh, but you know, as long as the information gets out there, it's good. And, you know, you leave something behind for, you know, uh, after you're dead, hopefully you, you can live on a little bit in the books or whatnot. But I, I thought that would be a useful uh, thing to, to do. So it's been enjoyable so far. I think, you know, it definitely helps, uh, with the co-author, uh, uh, Nick, uh, Nick Mutton. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but he's, he was a good co-author to have because he's very driven and competitive. And so he'd be like, Hey, how many pages did you write today? I wrote eight, you know, and you're like, Oh, I guess I better get writing, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> compare, you know, but, but he's also, you know, he was a pretty good writer as well. So that was uh, helpful. And, and I think we, you know, our, our writing styles meshed well enough. Um, I did kind of, uh, have, you know, it does, it does humble you a bit too. Cause I, I asked, uh, Dave Barker to write the foreword to the green tree Python book that I put out. And, uh, and he read, you know, some of the chapters and he's like, you know, I really like the information, but you probably want to have like an editor that's really good with English, uh, go through your book. And I'm like, oh crap. I thought I wrote, I thought I wrote it pretty well. You know, in my head, I'm all, uh, you know, I've written two books already. And then all of a sudden he's saying, nah, you need a little help. I'm like, okay. So I hired some, you know, uh, English student to go through the, and man, they're expensive to get somebody to edit your book. is like, you know, 50 bucks an hour. It's ridiculous. So I kind of had them go through a couple of chapters and like, okay, I think I get the gist and see mo where most of the changes are occurring. So if the book sucks after chapter two, that's probably why, but um, <laughs> it, it, it's a, it's a fun thing. Uh, I've, I've had a few uh, lessons learned on marketing those books. I, uh, sold uh well i arranged to sell uh, ten thousand dollars worth of books to this australian guy that had put on these symposia that i i went and spoke at my first trip was actually uh part of it was going and speaking at the symposium and then the second trip was uh also built around a symposium so he flew us out um you know paid for the flights paid for a couple herping trips you know to different areas and so I was thinking, oh, this guy, you know, I can trust him. Well, I found out that he had screwed over the Kuligowskis, and and uh, this was after I had the shipment of books heading his way, and he hadn't paid yet. And, you know, he kept saying the check's in the mail, and I was thinking, well, I got to get them shipped to him, you know, I'm going over there soon. And so, yeah, the check never came, and he kind of started, he, he said I was trying to swindle him somehow, and I was the bad guy, and so... He was teaching me a lesson to not be a bad guy and charge him a, a higher rate than I should have. And I didn't know of any other rate. And so I, I guess he called Bob Ashley and Bob said, oh, yeah, there's if you order a certain number of books, you can have a kind of a price reduction that I didn't know about. So I was just doing what I thought I was supposed to do. And uh, then he, yeah, stole the books and started selling them for like half the price. And I'm just like, wow. thinking, and this was the first book, you know, so I'm out 10 grand and I'm, you know, going to be destitute and you have to declare bankruptcy or something. We, I was still in, in uh, or just out of grad school, so I was not making a lot of money, you know, so it was a little rough, but luckily uh, Bob went to bat for me and, and en ended up getting him to pay. So Bob really helped me out there. I owe, I owe him a lot. And, uh, and so I kind of learned my lesson that you, know, you can't trust everybody. I assumed people were trustworthy, but it may have been a bad assumption. <laughs> so yeah, it was a hard lesson to learn. <laughs> yeah, when you when you look to trust people, you gotta see how long their mustache is. <laughs> That's right. All about the length of the mustache, man. The longer the mustache, the more they're more trustworthy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Longer you can trust me. I promise you can trust me. Yeah. <laughs> But see, if I were you, I would have taken my um, six foot um, buddy over to his house and knocked on his door. But um, I'm not sure if he knows how to fight because it doesn't sound like he can fall very well. Yeah. <laughs> the guy with the bad hip probably isn't going to help you out. Like, <laughs> well, that, that's that's a funny story because uh, he he screwed over somebody else over in Australia, and this this guy lived next to. Um, uh, mafia guy, and the guy said, uh, "You want me to take care of him?" And he's like, "Like, like rough him up." And he's like, "Do you want me to get, take care of him permanently?" And he he had to think about it for a little while. He's like, "Yeah, you know, maybe the world would be better off without this guy." So, but uh, he ended up saying no. So unfortunately, that was 
uh, before he swindled me. So we could have avoided this if he would have just went along with his neighbor's proposal. <laughs> uh, maybe next time. <laughs> yeah. But it was, it was kind of fun too. Cause he, uh, he paid for my trip up to Darwin and then he left me stranded there. So I had to buy my own ticket back and that was like salt in the wound, you know, still in my books. Then I had to buy my own ticket back uh, to Sydney from Darwin, but. Ah, I guess he paid for me to go up there, so I can't whine too much. But you got half price, man. <laughs> yes, there's worse places to be stuck, but yeah. <laughs> so, can I ask uh, another little, maybe fun question? What was your your scariest find when you've been out harping? I know, because I mean, you definitely go out harping a lot, and um, scariest find, like. Yeah. Maybe not falling out of a cliff be like waterfall, but <laughs> just say hey, just for the record, it doesn't have to be a reptile. Yeah. Dave last week told us a story about a skunk. So oh, yeah. yeah, I heard that. Yeah, that's yeah. a that would be a scary one. I mean I when I was a kid, um we were hiking through this place kinda on the border of Utah and Arizona. I was with my family, you know, we we're just on like a family vacation. And we were walking down this trail on this huge like I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was either a Grand Canyon or a midget faded rattlesnake goes across the trail and it's just gorgeous. You know, this uh, reddish coloration and just really nice. And I'm like thinking, I want to take that home. So I'm like, dad, can I take it home? You know? And uh, he said, I'll go ask the, the park ranger or whatever, you know, the, the, the visitor center, if, if it's okay to take one. And so he goes and he's like, keep an eye on it. And, and, uh, and I'll come back, you know, once I talk to the ranger. So I'm watching it. And all of a sudden this thing goes crawling under this big boulder. And I'm thinking, oh, if it goes underneath that boulder, I'm never going to see it again. I won't be able to take it home. So I grabbed it by the tail. And I start, you know, trying to pull it out of the hole. I'm like, you know, 15 years old or something, invincible, of course. And, uh, and and you know, it's it's buzzing its tail and just freaking out, trying to thrash around, get in, try to pull itself into this hole. And so finally, I'm like, okay, I'm either, I'm gonna hurt it, so I might as well let it go. I don't know what I'd do if it if I pulled it out anyway, you know. So I let it go, and as soon as I let go of the tail, the head came right out of the rock, like right near where my hand was holding onto the tail. So he was coming back to you know defend himself a little, and I probably would have taken a bite if I hadn't let go of it right then. So that, that you know made me gave me a little respect for the animal and. <laughs> Made me think I probably shouldn't be grabbing rattlesnakes. So I probably, I'll admit that wasn't the last time I grabbed a rattlesnake, but uh, that was probably the scariest time I grabbed one. Um, I was up uh, flipping rocks up uh, up one of the canyons up here in northern Utah, and I uh, I flipped one rock, and all of a sudden there's this gay porn magazine under the rock, and I'm like, oh, and I start looking around, and it's kind of like. Uh, there's like a hobo camp vibe and I'm thinking, Oh no, I, I think I've just inter you know, wandered into somebody's camp and I, I wasn't looking around. I was just looking for rocks to flip, you know, looking for rubber boas or something. And so I, uh, carefully laid the rock down and found a different place to, to hurt. But that was a little bit of a, a shocker. Geocaching. Yeah. <laughs> one of my, one of my favorite herping stories of, uh, kind of a weird thing was, uh, we were up in the tablelands. Um, we had a couple groups of us and, you know, two different cars. And so I was with one car and we were herping along and, and I was, you know, I hadn't seen, we'd seen a jungle carpet, but it was really ugly. So I was hoping to see a, you know, a nicer looking jungle carpet to get a picture for the book. And we were cruising along and all of a sudden in the road is this beautiful bright yellow and black banded jungle carpet. And everybody jumps out of the car. We're so excited. And we run over and it's a rubber snake <laughs> and the, the, the other guys had left out for us. And, and then I remembered seeing Rico Walder holding a bag of plastic snakes. And I, I was thinking, what's he doing with that? And it didn't occur to me that he was leaving them out for us to find. So that was kind wow. of a, that was a good trick. So if you ever, uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, Alan Rapashi had a good joke on us too. We were, uh, up in the iron range on the same trip and they were driving the other car and they were behind us. And, uh, I guess they didn't want to be in the rear. They wanted to lead the charge so they could find the snakes first or whatever. So he goes, Hey, you guys just missed the snake. Hurt. You know, it's back here. We got it. And, 
And so we all stop the car and jump out and they just drive past us laughing like, ha ha, now we get to be in front. So yeah, good time. We got them back though. Cause we were, uh, they, we were headed to this, uh, smugglers tree and, uh, you know, it's like this tree that these smugglers had pounded these uh, spikes into so they could climb up and get uh, chicks from like black palm cockatoos and, uh, and the eclectus parrots there in the, you know, north, uh, the far north Queensland. And so we we're going to go see that, pull one of the spikes out for a souvenir or whatever. Well, they, we we're on the way there. And, and I don't know if you know, Alan is, he's like a Baja racer. So he does these like thousand mile races in Baja, California. And like, so he knows how to handle himself on wow. a dirt road. Like he can, you know, it scares the crap out of you, but he's, he's a really good driver on those dirt roads. So they just took off and they were gone to the, to the smuggler tree or whatever. And so we were, we were driving along and I thought, well, let's, you know, while we're driving through the rainforest, let's uh, spotlight for green tree pythons. And so, you know, we we're just looking out the windows with our, our flashlights and all of a sudden I see this just neon green sign, you know, just saying the green tree python right here, you know, so we pull over and there's a, just this perfect green tree python sitting in the tree. And so we just sat and, you know, take, took pictures and stuff and, we marked where it was so we could take the guys back, but they totally missed out on seeing the green tree up front because <laughs> they took off too fast to go see the smuggler tree. But that was a cool find. That was with uh, Rico again. So I was, I was there when he when we found his first uh, green tree python in the wild. That was kind of a fun deal. That's an awesome memory, man. Yeah. Rico, he was a good guy, man. Yeah. Uh. And hearing you talk about all your herping experience makes me feel like I don't go nearly enough because I'm like, you should write a memoir of just like going herping because you have some great stories, man. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of fun to be had. I recommend getting out where you can. I mean, you guys have some good herping around you. You're not too far from like Snake Road, right? And some of those places. Well, I mean, I'm in Missouri. Those guys are in New Jersey. There's nothing oh, in New, New Jersey. Jersey. You talk oh, about those guys. <laughs> you got the pine barons, right? Yeah, he's got like like barons, big barons. <laughs> yeah. We just were in the pine barons on Saturday looking for stuff. Didn't yeah. find anything really. <laughs> yeah, crap in the pine barons, but we got them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trick, I guess. You gotta you gotta kinda know when to go and how to look for stuff. I mean, it's always hard starting out because you spend all this time and you find Jack, you know, and and then you go out or once you learn kind of what, what you're looking for or when the best time to go, it makes it a lot easier. That's for sure. Um, I, and, and some it's, it's the weirdest thing with herping is like, you can go, we went to fog dam. You've heard of fog dam. It's like, uh, up in uh, Darwin area. And it's like this, uh, area where they study water pythons, right? And there's yeah. like the highest density of predators, water pythons in a, in a, in a given area compared to any other species, right? And so, I mean, the, the number of water pythons in that area is huge. So we went to the fog dam thinking, okay, we're gonna be swimming in water pythons. We saw no water pythons. We saw like a couple frogs, maybe a couple lizards, and that was it. We're like, well, what's the big deal about this place? We saw no water pythons, you know, what's going on? Well, we went back the next night and we saw seven water pythons, you know, in one night. And I, you know, I, one night apart and, you know, the, it's completely different outcome. So it just depends on a lot of things, you know, it's really hard to, to call. And uh, like this last trip, I mean, I, I saw a Gila monster, but we saw, I think just one, one snake on the road while we were cruising at night, you know, and, we found a couple that had been hit by cars and stuff, but you know, the snake activity was near zero. So it was really kind of a, you know, one of those things. I guess I used up all my luck in the Gila on the first night and <laughs> came back to get me after that. But yeah, no, we had, um, it was Oklahoma city. I got put on a road. Um, they promised a bull snake and bull snake was one of our targets for Oklahoma. Yeah. And we get on this road and within the first 20 feet, we find a bull snake and then we find a massive saga and then we find another bull snake and then a checker garter and then another massive saga. So the next night we take, um, Jeff Breyer out with us talking this spot up. Yeah. We find a fucking thing the entire night and we probably cruise. We started cruising an hour to an hour and a half earlier that night. And we mm -hmm. stayed about an hour and a half later, nothing on the road, one yeah. DOR black rat. And that was it. Yeah. 
Yeah, wow. it's weird. I, I don't I don't get it. You know, I guess. And I mean, the more you go out, the more you learn. It's it's a lot of luck and just being in the right place at the right time. Because you know, if you miss that spot where the snake's crossing the road. You're not going to see that snake, you know, and you might have a high density cruising, but if you're not in the right spot at the right time, you're not going to see that animal. Yeah, um, even the moon, full moons make it really hard to go road cruising. Um, yeah. you know, there's so many little variables. If it's a little draftier that night, a little more windy, you're not going to find much on the road. Um, well, that depends yeah. too, because uh, some species are more apt to come out in the wind. Like if, uh, especially out in the deserts because like owls have a harder time flying when it's really windy. And so, you know, the snakes know to come out when it's windy cause they survive better or something. I was, I was, uh, in, uh, Southern California out Borrego Springs and I was looking for those shovel nose snakes. And, uh, um, I start, you know, road cruising right at dusk and I'm not seeing anything. And then it's like just windy as all get out. And so I texted Jeff Lamb. I'm like, dude, is there any sense staying out here? You know, am I wasting my time? It's really windy. And before he could text back, I found like three snakes on the road. And, and then that night was like a 30 snake night, man. There were snakes everywhere and it was windy as all get out. So, you know, I'm thinking that's gotta be something to it. You know, maybe it just depends on where you're at and, you know, but yeah, moon and wind and rain and moisture levels or whatever, all that stuff really plays into it. And it's really hard to predict. Um, with limited experience or you just have to go out and try it, you know, and keep going. Don't, don't quit hitting the pine barrens just cause you got skunk the first time out. <laughs> we've been, we've been a handful of times and we've found almost nothing almost every time. Yeah. Uh, just happens to be, I think that we need to find maybe the right place that we go consistently to try yeah. to, to, you know, like what you guys are saying, different variables so where we can kind of say, all right, well, this is a, a better night or this is, a, you know, this type of condition and try to hit the same spots. We kind of go to different places every single time. Yeah. And, uh, we'll, we'll get there. We're getting there. We're trying to do it more and more, but it's, it's tough finding the time a lot of times as you yeah. guys. Know. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's always nice to, to try new spots, but once you find a spot where you can find stuff, it's always like, autopilot you know i know if i go here i'm gonna find this or that or the other and and if i go this place i'll probably find this but yeah if you if you don't know the area too well I, we have some good tools though like i don't know if you guys are familiar with the iNaturalist app but it's an app that lets you log any any kind of animal plant you know insect whatever you put it into the app and then experts get on and help you identify it and so like if you're like, what's that? You know, you take a picture of it, put it in the app, and then you have like it, the app gives you recommendations on based on what your locality and stuff like that. But you can get on the app and like search. Like if you go onto the website iNaturalist, um, uh, it you can like search for different species, and it shows you where records have been made, and so you know, okay, at least in the past they've been found in this area. And you can, you know, target the area where you know they've been in the past, or and so at least you have some kind of uh, information on where they might be found. But tools That's like that are really helpful. I, I like uh, Flickr as well because you can get on there, and they usually have the time they posted the pictures. And typically, people post pictures fairly soon after they see the stuff, and so you know you can get on there and okay, it looks like they're posting pictures of. Gila monsters in April through June. And so I'm going to focus my herping between April and June if I want to see a Gila. And you know, nobody's posting pictures of Gila in June, July, August. So I'm not going to, you know, look for Gila's at that time. So, you know, different That's things funny. like that are really helpful. Yeah, there's a spot in Missouri um, based on Instagram photos. Uh, me and Jeff Galewood were talking about it. It's called Hogtober. Because mm -hmm. there's just so many Western hog noses oh. in that one area at this time in October. Oh, that would be uh, cool. You can find them other times of the year there, but October seems to be that time where you're almost guaranteed to find one. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, why I was excited that the Herpeton was in San Diego in May and, you know, or first week of June or something, because that's when the, the shovel nose snakes are in the highest abundance, you know, when you find them out uh, cruising a yeah. lot. So. Yeah, some yeah. Sometimes the year you're gonna have a lot better chance of finding a certain species, and it's good to know that information. And you know the the scientific publications. You know you can get on the uh, it's called Google Scholar, 
Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Google Scholar, you can look for primary literature that way. You just type in the species name. And if there's a link to the right, then it's a free, you know, you can read the paper for free. It's a really good resource for finding information about different species as well. Man. So, um, so you work, like you said, you work a lot of different stuff. Um, you know, this hobby, we all have a hoarder's mentality. We always want something new. Yeah. You have your eyes on a new species you plan on working with soon? Or are you content with where you're at right now? Um, I mean, I'm somewhat content, but there's always something that, you know, I, I need, you know, in the, but, uh, I, I'm pretty selective about my projects this year. I feel like I work with most of the stuff that I like, uh, I'd, I'd love to have some centralian blue tongues. That would be really high on my list. Um, I'd love to work with some rough scales again. I had a pair yeah. uh, that I had for a customer, but uh, I, and, you know, so I had them for a little while and they were a lot of fun to work with. I'd like to work with them again. Uh, diamond pythons are another one that's kind of high on the list. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, if I could find some parentes, that would be great. <laughs> Any leads on those? <laughs> but I don't know if I have 40 grand for a pair of parentes, but you know, that's, that would be another one I'd love to work with someday. Um, parentes are tough to find in the States for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seems uh, like lace monitors are all over the place right now, but uh, yeah. I, yeah, I was really nice. tempted. Some of those uh, Bell's phase look pretty sweet. Uh, we got right. to see a, a Bell's phase in the wild. I, I went on a trip with uh, my three oldest kids and we were, cruising through uh, somewhere in Queensland and we stopped to go look at this waterfall. We were walking along the trail and there's, there's this beautiful bell's phase just sitting on the base of this tree, you know, um, sunning or something. And I'm like, I, I was thinking, well, and I've, I should have learned this lesson before because it's come back to bite me before, but you always take a picture first before you try to grab it. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to try to be a big deal in front of my kids and catch this big lizard. And so I kind of sneak around the tree and I'm ready and I, I reach and I like just miss like, you know, brush the tip of his tail or something. And he ran clear up the tree. And then I'm taking these, you know, crappy distant shots of him instead of a nice close up picture. So did the same thing with a uh, uh, Catalineatus, a striped tail monitor in uh, in Western Australia. It was a beautiful monitor, just sitting there. Same kind of thing. I went to make the grab first because I thought, oh, I'll be able to catch it. But it was like liquid lightning, and I, I don't even know where it went. Like, it just disappeared. <laughs> so I'm like, I didn't get a picture of that one, you know, not, not even a crappy picture. So uh, what do you do? But someday I'll learn my lesson. But, yeah, they're uh, – those Bell's phase lace monitors are nice looking. I was really thinking maybe I, maybe I'll have room and we're, we're moving. We're in the process of moving right now. So uh, pretty soon I'll have a double the size herp room. So I might have room for a lace monitor cage in there. So yeah, that's what I'm talking be, about. We'll be able to do. Yeah. <laughs> We've been wanting to get into dwarf monitors because, you know, space is always an issue for everybody, but you know, if, if I had the opportunity to get some lease, I would definitely figure it out. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Right. They're yeah, awesome. I'm glad to see glad to see people having uh, success captive breeding those in the states. Absolutely, it's, it's great. Cool more more opportunity for that. Um, the hard thing is when you know the people who are having success move on to something else, and then the success goes away or something. So, but it looks mm -hmm. like quite a few people are are producing them. So that's a good good sign. I guess. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Their lace monitors are fun. There we we've uh, chased a few of them. I remember we went to uh, uh, we were with Peter Birch staying at his house, and we went over. There's this spot that he has that's like the cemetery, and we went over to the cemetery, and they have like all these Australian water dragons, and so we're you know taking pictures of them, chasing them around, watch Peter try to catch one there. They're, they're hard to catch as well, but we round the corner at this uh, cemetery and there's this giant lace monitor just sunning itself in the, in the leaf litter, you know, and, and uh, he's like, Hey, go for it, you know, go catch it. Or whatever. I'm like, uh, I got kind of close to it and it started hissing and puffing up. I'm like, how about you take this one? I'll get the next one, man. <laughs> like, they're impressive animals, and yeah, uh, oh, you want them to be uh, nicely uh, 
uh, tame down before you mess with them too much. But <laughs> even a tail whip would be tough, man. Oh yeah, yeah. I did. I did go for the next one though. He, I think he grabbed it by the tail and he's like, "Okay, get it behind the head." I'm like, "Oh, okay." But if I get bit, you know, I hope your uh, universal health care over here will take care of me. <laughs> so, yeah, but I just rub some Vegemite on the wound. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Vegemite. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah, I was down um Louisiana and we were just looking for water snakes, diamonds, bandits, so and so forth. And I had the flashlight going around and I see these eyes. And it's a raccoon. And I yell across the way and the guy who was hanging out with us from like Alabama and I was like, There's a raccoon in there. He's like, Grab it. And I was like, <laughs> like just grab it? <laughs> like, yeah, just just grab it. And I'm all like, well, I mean, I could be a pussy and not grab it, or I could grab this thing. And I thought it was a baby because the eyes are really close together. And I reached in and grabbed the fucker by the tail and yanked him out. And it was a full size raccoon. And the guy came around and he's all like, that'll fuck you up. I don't know what the fuck you're thinking. And really, I just didn't want to be a little wuss about it. But um, I think I have like one really blurry picture where you can hardly see it. And I wish we had a better one, but you just see these evil little eyes as I'm hanging in next to me. But <laughs> yeah, I was trying to go for the hat trick that night on mammals. Yeah. I bare, almost got a possum. I dove, grabbed it, and missed it, but I did get an armadillo. So really? one possum, one possum for the hat trick that night. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't you don't mess with mammals, man. That, 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 <laughs> I do not <laughs> jump on mammals. That is the last thing I'm doing. <laughs> oh, we, we were uh we were herping on Fog Dam looking for water pythons and we saw this. I'm pretty sure it was a slaty gray, like cl crawl down the rocks right on the, on the water side. Right. And we were there just before the wet season. So, you know, every, everything was concentrated into a small amount of water. And, uh, and Nick sees this snake and he's like a baby water Python. So he jumps out of the car and he runs down the, the hillside and he's got his back to the water and he's just searching the rocks, looking for this snake. And, and we look in the water and all of a sudden we see fish like jumping out of the water, like in a line towards him. We're like, dude, there's uh, something big under the water coming towards you. You might want to get up here. And he's like, no, I, I think I've almost got it. We're like, do you want to die for the <laughs> chance to see a baby water python? Yeah. I guarantee there is a big old salty just right under the water coming right for him. And we eye shined in the, in the water and there were just eye shines the whole, you know, the whole way across we they were, there was a lot of crocs in that little amount of water so we're like okay new rule nick doesn't go by the water <laughs> uh, i i was just thinking we're gonna have to make the call call his wife like sorry your husband's uh, in the belly of a crocodile <laughs> we we tried to tell him to get up but he didn't listen <laughs> i mean if there's a way to go that's the way to go for sure <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, I was if my I always tell my wife if she dies first, that's when I start working with like venomous snakes and crocodiles and stuff. <laughs> it doesn't matter, you know, after that. <laughs> so all your time over there, did you ever run into any salties or anything or um I mean those those ones at Fog Dam, we I mean just through the eye shines and stuff. Um we did I took my kids on like a little boat cruise when we were in uh in Cairns area and we saw a couple in the wild, you know, and the, by the roots of trees and stuff. Uh, so you just kind of caught glimpses of them. We kind of were, were there at the wrong time to really see the big ones out basking. Um, that's, you want to see those, like you want to go in the winter time, like in June and July to see big salties basking on the bank. Cause they, they, when it's hot enough, they don't need to come out of the water. So they're pretty, right. uh, they stay, they stay under, under the water. So, um, so I haven't seen the big ones, but we did, <laughs> we got to, uh, go tour this crocodile farm that one of our friends, uh, ran up in Darwin area and he needed help with a big salty transfer. So he had this like 30 foot long crate or 20 foot long crate that he wanted us to help him load this giant saltwater crocodile mail into. And so he got a top jaw rope around it. And then we all got to, you know, pull on the rope and pull this salty out of his cage. And, you know, he sat and death rolled and he's like, okay, wait till he's done death rolling and pull when I say pull. And so we're pulling this salty across the lawn and, and uh, we had to kind of feed the rope in through the, uh, through the, um, the shipping box and, uh, and then pull him into the shipping box. And he's just slashing his tail and smacking the box. It was, it was quite the adventure. 
I, I had it all, all filmed and I put it on YouTube and then my buddy's like, dude, you're going to get me fired. Take that down. <laughs> so I had to make it private. But every once in a while, I'll go watch the time we got to move a giant saltwater crocodile. That was pretty fun. But man, are those things powerful. <laughs> like they are just. That's a dream for me, man. Like, yeah. We, I think we probably all saw the video that there's like that zoo up in the northern territories where you can like go into this like acrylic cylinder and swim with these like 18 foot saltwater crocodiles and like yeah, man, the age of death at Crocosaurus Cove. We uh, it just uh, blows my mind to think about doing it. I can't wait. I'm gonna do it one of these days for sure. Yeah, that that was right around the time I found out I got swindled out of those books. So I was a little worried about money or <laughs> I might have paid to do that as well. But uh, Rico and Mark Spataro went in the cage of death and we, we told them that if they did it, they had to go in and, in, and view them during Amplexus. So <laughs> but they, I guess they didn't do that. I, I really wanted a picture of the two in Amplexus <laughs> watching a crocodile. <laughs> that would have been uh, a good one. Would, I'd do it. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> I say that now being safely in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the other cool thing at Crocosaurus Cove is they have like the, um, you can fish for crocs. So you put a little like meat on a, on like a piece of like just a wire or something. So it's just kind of hanging on there. And then you put the, put the meat in front of these crocodiles. They're younger crocodiles. So they'll jump and mm -hmm. uh, they jump like almost their full body length out of the water you know, these six foot, seven foot crocs. And so, you know, you kind of yank the meat up and get them, get them all jumping for it. It's really cool. Um, but one of the keepers said he was walking across this uh, barrier between a big old, you know, male salty and then these jumping crocs. <clears throat> and one of the jumping crocs jumped up and grabbed his calf. <laughs> and he like, you know, like bit onto him and he's like falling and he's like, do I fall into the, you know, six foot jumping crocs where there's like 20 crocs or do I take my chances with the big male and try to, you know, out swim him or something? He's like, oh, I'm going to die either way. It looks like, but I think he grabbed the wall and the croc let go and he was able to get out of there. But man, that, that was pretty close. <laughs> What's that decision to have to make? <laughs> yeah. How do I want to die today? <laughs> wow. oh, man. That's amazing. <laughs> That's a that's a cool place. That was one of my favorite zoos over in Australia. They just had a really diverse collection of uh, native, you know, Australian uh, wildlife, especially those endemic to the Northern Territory, which a lot of species I really like are there. So, I mean, they had like Glebopalma monitors and um, Kimberly rocks and stuff like that that were, you know, uh, cruising around their cages and stuff. It was really fun. And now they have Owen Pelly pythons, thanks to Gavin <laughs> Bedford. So. Nice. I need to make it back up there again. Go visit Gavin. Get a hold of Owen Pelly. That's one I haven't seen in the wild yet. So freaking every American that went over this year got to see Owen Pelly. Apparently, they all faked it. Come on, they faked three, it. Nah, three <laughs> different groups. I'm like, dang it. Why didn't I go to Darwin this last year? <laughs> yeah, the rarest python ever. Everybody gets to see it. Yeah. Know about that. <laughs> I, I had a friend that actually lived in the town of Owen Pelly. He was like a teacher up there for an Aboriginal community, and he would go out cruising for him like every night, you know, he after work or whatever. Um, nothing much going on, so he'd just go herping. The the uh, Aboriginals thought he was going and visiting their wives at, while they were out of town or something. <laughs> so he had to clear that up and show them, you know, what he was doing and where what he was looking for and so uh i think they started helping him after that but uh so uh, he wouldn't even say the name owen pelly python because he thought it would jinx him you know and i think he searched for a couple of years and then all of a sudden he found two of them in like the span of a week and at wow. the same time gavin bedford found like three more and so they got the group together to start this uh, breeding population of owen pellies so and same crazy. thing you know you just never know what's going to trigger these things to come out of the woodwork and all of a sudden be uh, found in the wild. So kind of cool. Hope, hopefully they'll make their way over here somehow. There's with, <laughs> where the rough scales made it over, you know, there's hope maybe the Owen Pellies could follow. Them. <laughs> I was watching that group of uh, pygmy skinks that 
showed up magically over in like the Ukraine or something last year. I was like, man, oh, if they made it to the States, that'd be freaking awesome. Yeah. I mean, I don't want anybody to poach anything, but like if it happens, that'd be an awesome <laughs> issue. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. I feel the same way. If it happens, I'm not complaining, but you know, uh, I don't know. Those things are cool, though. They they were thought to be extinct for a long time. I know. It was only like, what, two or three years ago that they just yeah. showed up again out of nowhere? That's amazing. Yeah, well, they figured out they were using these spider burrows, like these trapdoor spider burrows. Mm -hmm. They'd go in and eat the spiders and then live in the burrows. And they had like these family groups of these little pygmy skinks living in these burrows. And they'd you know, pop up and come out during certain times of the day. And some researcher stumbled upon them, but then he like didn't see them again. And so... He's, I, I can't remember if they like set up camera traps or something or pit traps. They found out they're pretty, you know, there's a pretty high density of them in certain areas where there's a mm -hmm. lot of trapdoor spiders. So crazy stuff. Not a lot of people going down trapdoor spider dens, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, right. <laughs> and then like they took some of those, uh, those uh, pipe cameras or whatever that the plumbers use. And they yeah. fed it on one and they like see there's like this little skink head and they go past it and they go down. There's another one below it. And then there's another one further down. It's really cool. I'm pretty sure that footage is on YouTube or something. But you got to check it out if you haven't seen it. It's pretty yeah, cool. find, like colonies of them down there using the same uh, funnel system. I, I love that kind of stuff. That natural history stuff is just cool. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, Dave, are you giving me that look like, is it... Uh, the that was not the fucking Tiger King look, if that's what you think just happened. <laughs> that, that was not what just happened. <laughs> yeah, that, that wasn't the look you got there. We discussed this. We're not going to keep all bringing right. this up ever. We can if we go... I, I get all worked up every time. Go ahead, just ask the fucking question. If you want to do it, I don't know if you're it anymore. Are people even still talking about this thing? Probably not. You're probably right. We are, and we are the internet, so let's just go, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's all. <laughs> you watched the Tiger King, Justin? Uh, yeah, we we enjoyed that one thoroughly. <laughs> I'm I'm just like I'm just thinking when are they gonna? I mean, it started out at Tom Crutchfield's place, right? I'm thinking when's that coming out? When are we gonna be the spotlight of you know America? Thinking we're a bunch of nut jobs. <laughs> it's coming. Uh, well, see, if you listen to our other podcasts, you would have heard us talk about it last time. The um, the it was all actually supposed to be about selling venomous animals in this community and how irresponsible we are, and that's what the beginning of that documentary was. And so they saw that what was it snow leopard or whatever in the back yeah. of the van. Yeah, that actually changed the direction they were going. So yeah. it could have been about this industry. Thing is, it probably wouldn't have been nearly as popular. No, <laughs> no one would have seen it. None of us would have watched it. It wouldn't have existed. We would have heard about it. We would have watched uh, it. No, no, we don't know. We don't know. The, the Tiger King was just something special. It just yeah. it shouldn't have been so good, but it was just so fucking amazing. Um, it was a complete shit show, and I love shit shows. Um, <laughs> yeah, it could have went another direction because that was the whole thing at Crutchfield's house, but luckily it didn't go that way. That's all we can thank COVID. I think COVID really <laughs> helped us uh, get into these things. And <laughs> uh, all we were missing was a dude with a huge handlebar mustache. Yeah, God, they're out there. Well, there was more interesting than there. There was there was some weird facial hair in that one, wasn't there? Uh, there was there was definitely some there stuff. There was some mullets that were you just couldn't compete with them. Like yeah, uh, those mullets. That's the that's the style, right? I I hear they're coming back right now, man. If I had a little more hair on top, I might do it again. But um, I'm out right not now. An have you guys seen uh, Ricky Mack? You seen Ricky Mack? And uh, he's like an Australian guy that goes out. He's, he's got some great videos of finding stuff over in Australia, but full on mullet, curly in the back. You know, he's uh, yeah, yeah. Man. Good stuff. Let's Check it out right now. <laughs> yep, Ricky Mack. Mac, look up. See, my favorite was the um, Peter Birch um, wedding photos. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh my god, that I was epic. I was oh. I was walking up his stairway, and I'm like, I look over, and there's this picture on the wall. I'm like, is that Peter and Joanne? What is he? Uh, are, <laughs> that like, is, that that a, him, right? is that a prince? <laughs> his <laughs> long flowing locks and his sword, and oh my gosh, that was, <laughs> yeah. that was the best. 
if I could get a high quality print of that, I would make it a felt painting on my wall. Like, <laughs> I'll see what I can do, man. <laughs> I got a number. Look, I can call him. I didn't want to embarrass him, but hey, if we're on the table here, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, my I my kids like I you know I'm like okay, what was your favorite part about Australia? And they're like. Hanging out with Peter and Joanne and Troy and Jess. Like, they're just hanging out with my, with my friends over there. That was the best part of their trip, you know. Those guys Peter, are great. Guy. I love Peter. Oh, he's so great, yeah. Peter and Colin, they're yeah. just they're, they're fun. They're awesome people. I love them. Yeah. Dave, hey, you lost electricity over there. What's going on? Yeah, I, um, you know, just, it just got a little bit scarier. That's it. You know, <laughs> everything's still okay. You know, just. Lights are not here anymore for some reason. I don't know why the fuck they turned the lights off. This place is abandoned. It should have been on in the first place. Um, <laughs> that that abandoned bowling alley needs some uh, good lighting, right? <laughs> it'd be nice because now I'm sure um, this is when the meth heads start coming out. We're going to start hearing stuff <laughs> in the background like tin cans kind of getting kicked around. At that point, I'm getting the fuck out of here. But for now, we're okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a big lose connection, you just randomly. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, if I lose connection yeah. randomly, I, I fled. I'm gone. <laughs> but I had a great time. All right. If, uh, if you're shining the flashlight and you see two beady eyes, you should probably jump on it. <laughs> yeah. Grab yeah. it by the I, tail. I'll consider it. I'll consider it. Look, man, it's all for YouTube, dude. You got to jump, jump on it, man. Come on. If that's what it takes to make this popular, I'll take one for the team. I promise. <laughs> We're trying if to go by. If a raccoon shows up out here when I'm doing a video or any other mammal, I'm going to grab it for you guys. You get that possum. You can make the make the possum happen. <laughs> yeah, I can do a possum. You know, armadillos. I mean, you have armadillos in Utah, right? No. No? No, they Fuck. don't make it this far. They don't. Yeah, they, um, there's quite a few of them in this state, like roadkill nonstop. And, um, mm. yeah, you can walk right up and grab those sons of bitches pretty easily. <laughs> Are they, um, they're, not, <laughs> they're not scary, are they, right? Don't they just curl up in a ball or something? Or do they – they got well, some pretty sharp claws? Oh, they have some claws. Well, the first thing they do is they try to spin real fucking fast. So you <laughs> grab their tail and they start spinning, and you got to stop the spin from happening because you don't want to cut your hand because they have leprosy. Oh, so you yeah. got to really squeeze down real hard when you grab them <laughs> if you don't have a glove. I don't always have a glove with me, but you get that tail real nice and tight, and then you can kind of – fuck you can hold them a little bit better <laughs> but um they don't have teeth because they yeah. have molars at best so yeah. it's the claws and um when they do the tornado spin is the <laughs> risky part but other than that it's, it's pretty easy yeah i i picked up a an echidna that one was pretty uh pretty oh, wild God. yeah and they'll sit and like kind of like jerk you know when you're trying to pick them up so they're sticking their quills into your hands and stuff yeah they're pretty yeah. uh pretty fun <laughs> That's over sticking to reptiles. Fish. Fuck mammals, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That's funny. All right. Well. Is this a wrap up? Did we just, did we peak? I feel like that was a peak right there. <laughs> Every time Dave says, did we peak? That means he's got to go because his phone's running low or it got dark or there's a thunderstorm or a tornado coming. The it's, meth heads are in the background. The meth heads are circling. <laughs> you know, I'm really not ashamed to say I am really afraid of the dark. Um, <laughs> that is playing in here, but, you know, it's realistic fears, not like monsters like normal. This is a crackhead thing. I'm There's a lot of crack and a lot of meth out here, and I'll be honest, <laughs> that's that's my biggest concern right now in the dark. But um, <laughs> I don't understand I mean, Ben and Ryan, if you got some more, I mean, I'm loving this. If you got something you want to throw at, otherwise, um, I'll be honest, I'm going to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I, I mean, I think we've done that over two hours. I think, you know, I think uh, unless, Justin, you have like 20 or 30 right. stories. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Justin, you spent a lot of time in Northern Territories. How yeah. many castaways have you run into? <laughs> I've, I've actually run into a handful of them. <laughs> we, we, uh, we're looking for a spot to find them and i was reading online you know where you could see them and they recommended this spot called eddie beach uh e-t-t-y and so i'm thinking okay we'll give it a shot we drive down there as soon as we get to the bottom of the hill there's a castle where we're walking along the beach you know beautiful beach and so i i'm i'm thrilled i jump out of the car run over there and start snapping pictures you know my kids are like dad you, sh you shouldn't get so close or whatever i'm like ah those are again the australians overblow things make them seem a lot more dangerous than they are 
it just walked along, did its thing. It paid me no mind at all. Didn't try to run at me or anything. If anything, it tried to get away from the the paparazzi that was going on there. But uh, we saw there was another one kind of in the jungle a little more, and that one I was a little more a little more nervous around. It looked a little more hesitant, like wary that I was there. And so I think I climbed up on a rock kind of above it where it was and was taking pictures that way. But I don't know. Cassowaries are like, they're like dinosaurs. And that's a, that's a dinosaur. Absolutely. That is the velociraptor of the modern day. Like yeah, man. impressive birds. But we, we saw, and then when we were driving out of there, there was another like one that crossed the road and we saw these chicks going into the underbrush. So it was a male with like three or four chicks in tow. So that was cool to see. So and we, we got to feed them at this little zoo in uh, Townsville or something. And, like, you chuck, like they gave us, like, a bowl of tomatoes. And you'd just chuck a tomato, and they would catch it and just swallow it in one gulp. Um, cool. I would bird. never imagine that's what you'd feed a cassowary. Right? <laughs> yeah, like they're feeding them whole tomatoes or any any fruit or vegetable. Or they're just chucking, chucking them. They just swallow them right down. Right. I guess the that's what they do. They walk around the forest looking for fruit. So yeah. they're just like, oh, you see them, they're gonna eviscerate you. So they're just gonna eat like your your internal organs. Like throw a liver at them, they'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> I asked I asked the, the zoo zoo lady, you know, it was uh, running the cassowary show. I'm like, okay, so you know everybody and she even said in her little presentation, Oh, look at their giant claw or whatever, they can rip you open and kill people and stuff. And I said how many documented cases of a cassowary death are there? And she said, there's one. And it was a, a, a little kid that was trying to kill the cassowary, and the cassowary defended itself, and the kid got, you know, disemboweled or something. But, yeah, he died of, you know, later on. It wasn't this, that moment either. So I think we're being uh, a little bit led astray there to make things look a little crazier than they really are over there. But, um, yeah, it was really fun to see the cassowary. And then uh, on the trip down to southern Utah, my friend's like, yeah, you can uh, – cassowaries are legal in Utah. You can keep one. And they're, they're oh, like wow. a chick for like – uh, thirty five hundred dollars or something. I'm like, that's that's actually doable. That's yeah. I have to get a cassowary. <laughs> that's I'm, a I, thing right there. <laughs> yeah, the greenhouse might be a little expensive, but yeah, the cassowary is somewhat affordable. <laughs> yeah, there's um there's a auction this weekend, like an exotic auction in Missouri. I'm pretty sure they're gonna have cassowaries there. That pretty that would good. be a cool pet. Oh, those things are sweet looking. Oh, yeah. Epic. Yeah. Uh, they're cool birds. <laughs> the emus okay. are fun too. Like we saw a bunch of those out there. My kids really got a kick out of those. They go try to run after them or what chase them and stuff. So, but they they make that big like boom sound. You know, I think the mm. cats do that too. That really deep boom. <laughs> it's pretty pretty cool to hear. Yeah. The crazy thing is, we have a ton of them here in New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. We saw some uh, in a neighborhood on the other side of the valley. I'm like, man, I didn't think you could keep them up here because it gets so cold. But, you know, they had, a, they had some with the, it raised some chicks, had some little baby emus. I'm like, hey, maybe emus. <laughs> hey, I love the emu. Um, you know, we have the one out here and we actually just got a second one. And Oh, yeah, that's I mean, right. You yeah, guys... they're, they're pretty dumb. They're, they're extremely dumb. <laughs> Um, very dopey, very like <laughs> you'll be coming down the driveway and it'll panic for no reason and go mm -hmm. running off and it'll have a bunch of, um, shit. What the hell did we raise with it? Um, I can't remember what little bird we raised with it, but there's a bunch of those scurrying behind it. And the new <laughs> one's pretty dopey too. It's still a baby, but I'll do emus. Um, I'll never do a cassowary. I just, uh, I'm a pussy. I, it's high risk. No high risk in my life. <laughs> they needed a little warmer too, like a rainforest conditions. But I, yeah. they, there was some like trick you could do with emus in the wild where you like get on your back and you put your feet up in the air and like move them like a bicycle motion or something. And that's supposed to attract emus to come over and see what's going on. And I saw somebody <laughs> do it on a YouTube video and it worked. Like the emus came over. But they didn't come over when I tried. I just looked like an idiot. So <laughs> yeah, that, um, that just sounds like Australians fucking with Americans to me. Yeah, right? I think <laughs> that's the case. Yeah, I'm gonna look the video up, but I'm just not buying it. <laughs> yeah. Ever since I saw that video of the emu playing with the little uh, puppy inside the house, like jumping around, spinning around, I was like, I gotta get an emu. My wife's like, no. 
It's <laughs> not happening. That thing's gonna get six foot tall and be like, uh, you know, kicking in the stomach. Like I'm not dealing with that crap. <laughs> Well, I know you two are just going to show up sometime, even though you're not invited. And when you do, you're more than welcome to hang out with the email. Listen, we're on. invited. We're invited. Yeah, you guys are invited. I'll, I'll think about it. No, no, no. <laughs> Look me in the eyes when you say it. I don't know if I'm looking you in the eyes right now. I'm just trying to focus right there. I don't. I'm looking you in the eye. Looking you in the eye. Yeah, you are. This is real. <laughs> you stared yeah. into a soul. <laughs> That's a soul stare there. <laughs> Well, that was that was so we honestly. So um, That's fine. Yeah, so I hate to say it, guys. Um, I, I don't want to be the guy. You guys can keep going without me, but I'm I'm at like two percent, and I don't want to just get cut off because you know I, I really like being able to say goodbye. So we know you like, have the battery bank. <laughs> hey, fucker, maybe I don't this time. Well, here's the thing: my hairless cat ate one of our um phone chargers. We're a one phone charger ho- a household right now. So yeah, no, I don't have one with me. That's yeah, a true story. Cats are trouble, man. They're they're trouble. I just they're decided he wanted to pee on everything all of a sudden. So, <laughs> uh, it's our werewolf cat that does that, the light oh, yeah. But yeah. what's happening is the hairless cat, seeing she's such a bitch, is guarding the um, litter boxes, and we got like seven or eight litter boxes. So yeah. it's making the light koi too afraid to use them. But um, oh, we're man. working on it. I showed my kids a picture of your Lycoy, and they got freaked out. They're like, "Isn't that thing amazing? Everyone's yeah. scared of it. I think it's the coolest thing so ever." So cool, yeah. We had yeah. we had like this feral cat in our neighborhood that kind of looked like that, but it was like had mange or something. It was, and it was like it was eating this garter snake that had been run over by a car, and it was like peeling it up off the the, the pavement. I took a picture for my kids. Gave nightmares for like a week. You know? <laughs> yeah, so um, we just had to take the Lycoy to a vet recently, and we're in like a real small town. There's like 107 people here, yeah. and we take that thing out of the box, and I'm all like, "Yeah, here's what's wrong with it." And the guy's staring at it. And he's all like, "Well, what else is wrong with it?" <laughs> There's uh, no wrong I don't with know it. what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, how it's um, supposed to look. <laughs> yeah, we it's supposed to look. Good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we genetic, we bred this thing to look ugly. That's that's yeah. just the one. <laughs> yeah. But, um, no, it's yeah. a cool breed. Um, yeah. you know, when Brittany Gobble was getting out of them, I just had to get one before she was completely gone. But um, mm. I don't know. I'm gonna send you guys all the picture. We might have to post it in this very moment while I'm talking about it. Mm. There is a midget Litecoin now, and um, it's fucking amazing. Oh, wow, like that cool. is the next abomination I'm adding to my household is a midget light <laughs> It's the perfect name really too, because it does look like something transforming into a werewolf. I mean, it's yeah. it's crazy looking. Yeah. Do you know yeah. who's breeding that? Yeah. Well, do you know who's breeding that? Um, I gotta find it. I do know whoever did it. Like the entire cat community tore them apart for doing it. Um, I, I don't them. know. So just let them know that they have a fan in me. Yeah. Oh, when you see this little thing's face, trust me, we're all gonna, you're gonna all fall in love. I promise. Even if your kids hate it, they're gonna love the midget version. You gotta love it. I'll I'll give it a try. Yeah, Yeah. I promise. I've always had a soft spot for really ugly animals and the other people consider ugly. I really like that stuff. Yeah. I'm the same way. Uglier the better. I mean, most of the cats we have are hideous and I love them for it. I need a fruit bat in my life, I think. We, we were in uh, Australia driving to a campground, and all of a sudden we look up, and there's just this flock of fruit bats or whatever you call them flying over top. I mean, it looks like dinosaurs, you know, like some three-foot wingspan. Just It was cool, and there were thousands of them. They just like this big cloud that kept going. And then so we set up camp, and we're all cool, and, and then like 3 o'clock in the morning, like there's just this huge ruckus outside the tent. We're like, what is going on out there? We come back and the bats had come back to roost and they were all over the campground, like just making this horrible noise and like waking everybody up. It was fantastic. I was like, whoa, you guys, isn't this awesome? My daughter's like, no, it's That's horrible. Great. She oh, like has flashbacks of the, the time the fruit bats attacked or whatever. It was- <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, man. Well, Dave, I know I don't want to cut this short, but I know that your phone's dying. Do you want to? You, know you guys can go on without me. I mean, it's gonna be tragic and not nearly as much fun. But um, I think <laughs> you guys can manage. You guys do this without me sometimes, right? <laughs> uh, we've kept them for two and a half hours. It might be polite to let them go. 
Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a round two because this was really fun. This we can do a round two. Bring a couple it. other people on next time. I mean, I think that'd be great. Maybe get Warren Booth to stop in and say hello for a little bit, get talking. Yeah. yeah. It'd be yeah. Cool to do a round table with a couple of guys. It'd be awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to get um, Warren on here. Like I said, I love listening to him talk, man. You got an accent. You are welcome on the show. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's cool. Sure. All right. Well, Ryan, you want to uh, take us out? I'm not. Dave said he's the closer. Oh, yeah. And by the closer, I still don't even know what we're closing here. Uh, you guys have branded it underneath your company name. It's not even like a collaboration anymore. Um, <laughs> This is well, RB Reptiles channel. I'm sorry, Dave. You can start your own channel if you want. Is that what you want? Is that what you want, buddy? You want me to go no. out on my own? I'll go out on my own right fucking now. I would love to see you take the time to edit this. I'm not going to take any time. I'm going to send it all to Ben and pay Ben to do it for me. <laughs> He's looking for work. Are you? Okay. You want to be my guy? Oh, man. Hey, you fuckers are going to miss the artwork, and you know it. But, um, you are the best. Artwork. That is that is definitely an eye catcher. Anytime I see the the covers of one of your uh, podcasts, it's fantastic. You're just wait your your scene, but I've already got it worked <laughs> up in here. I'm going to work on it as soon as I get home. <laughs> yeah. Dave, Dave's got All right. it. All right. I, I'm I'm All excited right. to see what you got in store for me. <laughs> but, well, I, I, I'll, I'll take it out. I'll, I'll I don't want. Hey, that was me taking Dave. it out right there. There were taken out words just then. Now you're interrupting me. Look, I don't want to. You know, you got a lot of pressure with a thumbnail. I'll take care of it. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Ryan. You're so well spoken, all buddy. I just want to thank you so much, Justin, for coming on. You, your wealth of knowledge. You're very. You have such entertaining stories about herpin. It's awesome, guys. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. YouTube loves thumbs up for some reason. Give it a thumbs down, even. I don't care. Whatever you no, do. Click something except the unsubscribe. Click the subscribe button. Give us a comment. Let Justin know you enjoyed his conversation. See us next time. Peace. Thanks, I'm guys. A professional. Is that good? You guys are cool. laughing. All right. Solid. Yeah, yeah, Justin, that was awesome, buddy. Um, I'll be honest. I think out of all the ones we've done so far, you're the first one who just kept talking and didn't shut the fuck up. Um, <laughs> everyone else has been these long pauses. That was great, man. We couldn't even get a word in with you. Oh, good. I'm, I, uh, I don't know. I heard somebody say that once. Like, if you're on a podcast, just keep going because then it fills the time. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it works. It's a blessing to have people that have something to say on here. Yeah. <laughs> we've had people on here that are, we had the coax like two sentences out of like it's been tough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how how far are you away from home, Dave? It's how like 15, 20 minutes down the road, just where I'm at. We're like on the top of a mountain. The Wi-Fi out there is just not good enough for a podcast. Yeah. Um, I learned that the hard way the first time I tried doing a podcast with um, Forrest and MJ. Uh, that was entertaining, yeah. man. I, I was laughing the whole well, time. I really appreciated great. that. But yeah, yeah, fuck, man. I just had to jump in the car and start driving until I could actually work my damn phone. But um, oh, Poor Forrest was so pissed. He was just like, uh yeah. He was Forrest very is always good. pissed off, so um, <laughs> yeah, you know, that didn't bother me any. But um, honestly, it's really um, it's really this background that keeps on bringing me back here. That's I'm awesome. really loving bowling <laughs> things back here, but um, it makes it even better that it's abandoned, <laughs> abandoned. Yeah, no. yeah, That's classic. But, well, fuck yeah, like I said, I had a great time. I'm sure you guys are gonna hang out for a little bit and keep talking. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm probably gonna hit you up on Messenger, um, send you some pictures, get chatting about some herp and stuff. And if I pull through Utah, I'm gonna need you to take me out. Um, your thing, man. Anytime we gotta get together, yeah. man. That'd be awesome yeah. to go herping. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fantastic. I'll show you some good stuff. <laughs> awesome. Oh. Yeah, he, uh, that's all I want, man. Uh, my buddy yeah. just got back from Arizona. He found like three when he was down there. They oh. found a really nice little den site. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to get out there and get looking, but we'll see. I'll find yeah. time. Yeah, sounds good, man. I appreciate it, everybody. I'll be talking to you soon. All, all right. right. See you. All right, guys. So, Justin, uh, we appreciate it again. And, uh, no problem, guys. Good chatting with you. When I see you next time, I need to get an autograph on this. I only got Peter Birch's. All right. He, yeah. Well, he called me a shirt lifter in there. So, you know. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, Peter's great. <laughs>